All right. So welcome to Seventh Helix Podcast, where we ask, what does that even mean? Cool. And <laughs> today I'm with Matthew Goodemote. Yes, that's right. Is a physical therapist, my physical therapist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I figured out pretty quickly in going to physical therapy with you that you have you have the science down, but there's a slightly holistic thing there. There's like a little bit of something else. I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah. I talked to you about it. You called it the art. Yes. So I find that pretty interesting. Cool. I I would question your statement about I have the sciences down. <laughs> so what's interesting about that is um, this will get out. So my secret is going to be revealed today. I really don't consider myself a good physical therapist, especially with in regards to the science of it. So the art of it, that's a whole different game. Okay. So the science part of it, I'm always amazed. Like I have three therapists that work for me right now, and I'm amazed at how much they know that I don't know. And a lot of what I know is really trial and error and experimentation. <laughs> and I use patients as guinea pigs. <laughs> so... That- that's yeah. interesting because yeah. Uh, okay, so I guess I should say how I found you. Yeah, that's because a good that's, story. It's kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah, I yeah. I was getting these headaches for like a year, and I have I tried everything. I went to my general physician, and yeah. he said, you know, uh, they're just headaches. But you know, if you throw up again, if it's that bad, go to the ER. So I yeah. went to the ER the next time it was like that, and then they said. They did an MRI and they said, I, we don't see anything. So oh, it's, no brain, it's, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah. So they said they were cluster headaches. And yeah. I looked into those and I was like, this sounds terrible. Yeah. And But the more I looked at it, the more I thought, this doesn't, I don't think this, I think that cluster headache is a catch-all. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a term that means we don't really know what yes. this is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It seems really bad. So yep. here's a name for you. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought I had experimented with, I, I, with my exercise, I had stopped doing certain things, right. started doing certain things, and I just, I was at the end of my rope. I, I went to a chiropractor, and that didn't really help me very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, and then I heard you on, I was listening to WAMC. Yeah. Uh, was it Vox Pop? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love doing that show, too. Yeah. I yeah. want to ask you about that. Yeah. But I heard you, and you're a physical therapist, and I yep. thought, oh, I this is a sign. I guess I'll call. Yeah. And I called, and you knew exactly what I was talking about, just based on my description. Yeah. And I so I set up an appointment, and I was, I was, uh, cautiously optimistic because yeah. no, nothing had worked so far. <laughs> but then when I talked to you, I really liked that you had mentioned some things that were more, that weren't necessarily purely physical. Right. You know, there were things that maybe stress related or anxiety yeah. related or or uh, yeah. certain types of stress, and yeah. That just resonated with me because I have found that to be true in my life. And right. you can kind of feel it. So, like, yeah, I want to know if, if this makes sense to you. I did this. I've been doing this recently when I start to feel like my shoulders. A lot of what I'm doing is trying to get my up. shoulders down. When my shoulders start going up, I just <clears throat> take, like, a breath. And Perfect. I just try to relax, my, you know, and, <laughs> and, like, think, oh, whatever is bothering me right now that I'm not aware of is, it'll be fine. And yeah. As I exhale, my my shoulders go down. But it's not just my shoulders. It's like in my back. Everything kind of falls back into the correct place. Right. So part of the breathing is you stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system when you take deep breaths. That relaxes you. And it also oxygenates your muscles, which helps the muscles to relax. And what you're doing when you're lifting is you're lifting your sternum up, which that helps the thoracic spine and allows your head to go back into position where it belongs. And so the combination of all those things put your head in the proper position. And that call, when you called in, I've had, um, boy, I've had probably a dozen people on, on, not necessarily that specific show, but on separate shows talking about the headache. It's, I didn't realize how much of a problem it was for so many people. And yet it's, it's often very, very simple. And what you said, that it, this often happens in the medical system period, is we're not sure what it is, so we call it something. But once it's written down at that, number one, the patient starts to believe that's what I have. That's just, that's, this is the art we're talking of now. And if it's not the right diagnosis, then you go down the road of all the wrong things because it's not what it is. So when I went to my, my main trainings in what's called the McKenzie Method, and the, our teacher there was a guy named David Poulter. 
And the very first day he talked about how the patient has all the answers. So we have to ask the patient to find out what is going on. And no matter how bad you want it to be something you're good at treating, it is what it is. So if it, if it is a cluster headache, it will respond to a cluster headache treatment. It will have the characteristics of a cluster headache. Everything about it will say, scream at you, this is a cluster headache. And so if you're just simply reading and you're seeing, well, that's not really what it sounds like to me, it ain't it. And so what I learned, that was I was only three years out of school when I went there, and that completely changed how I did physical therapy. Mm. Because at that moment, and from that moment on, I try my best to hear the patient, what's going on with them, and I go into evaluations blind. I don't try to read any information. I don't, I don't, any of the paperwork that gets done, I literally don't even look at it. And the reason is because I'm trying to see and also observe how you're moving, what you're doing, to see does it match what the diagnosis would be. And so just in a, on the radio show, I, I, I have like, you know, five seconds to get to, to a point, but we can maybe talk about this later. I had a radio show in my hometown, I was, uh, it's called back talk. So I had people call in asking questions about back pain and neck pain. And so I got good at asking just a couple quick questions to know, yes, it's this, no, it's not that. And that's, so I kept getting more and more direct with my questions and fewer and fewer. So that we, we, we actually practiced this in my training too, where you, you'd have, you get three questions to figure out what it is. And then you get two questions to figure out what it is. And then you get one question. Can you figure out what it is? And we played the game with each other and we would make up a diagnosis and people would have three questions. Can you figure out what it is? And the, the point of the exercise is to not ask un, or irrelevant questions and fluff questions. Mm. Like, are you right-handed or left-handed? Who the hell cares? It, it's completely irrelevant to the diagnosis. So why are you asking it? The reason why you ask is because it's going to affect their function. But that's not now. That's down the road stuff. Let's see if we know what this is first. Because if we don't know what it is, then it doesn't matter if you're right or left-handed. So I got really, really specific in my questioning. And then I did that for years so that I would I would do an evaluation in like five minutes because I practiced being very, very direct. And then the rest of the time, it was the art of therapy. It had nothing to do with diagnosis. I was trying to get a feel of the patient. Are they somebody that's uptight and stressed? Are they someone that's laid back and relaxed? Are they worried? Are they scared? And I spent a lot of time working with chronic pain patients and and reading body language and finding out you know, just how we hold ourselves, if we're all tense and things. And that's a starting point because if you can't even get out of that posture, I can't get you to do the movements I need you to do. And mm. so I had to learn to observe and and I, I play games where I go downtown with my kids and I'll diagnose somebody by the, how they walk. And I'll just you know observe somebody stepping up a step and I can tell you if it's they have a knee problem, they have a back problem, you know, things like that. And it's not uncommon, a lot of geeky physical therapists <laughs> do that, but, but I, it's, like, it's, it's weird to me because I, I really had no interest in any of this, but that's, what, that's like what my brain does. And so when, when I'm on the air, I'm really trying, or anytime, even in an evaluation room, I'm trying to find out, and it's usually one or two questions that, okay, I know what this is, and the rest of the time is, is fluff. It's really just getting a, a feedback for the patient so I know what they're going to want to do for therapy. But I've already figured out what's going to help them. And it, it rarely takes me more than a couple questions. And I typically will say that I'm, I'm, you know, I sound bold right now. And there's exceptions to that. But for the most part, I can just tell, yeah, I'm going to be able to help or I'm not going to be able to help. And one of the things I found, I don't know how long ago, but the, the positive comments and how valuable they are, like, oh, this is easy to fix. Don't worry about this. I got this. I know how to take you through here. I've seen this a hundred times. Don't worry about it. And and just those kind of statements, you can see the people like, oh. I, I have people crying because you're the first person that told me I'm going to be okay. And, and, you know, some of the reason is because in modern medicine, people are afraid of lawsuits and all that kind of crap. And so the doctors give the literal worst case scenario to someone that's got like a sliver, you know, that can get to an infection, we're gonna have to amputate your finger. Like, wait a second, let's just pull the sliver out. You know, it's not that big of a deal. And so, but then for the patient, then you're worried, you're fearful, and then everything in your life changes, how you move, how you do things, which actually just magnifies the problem. So instead of having a problem, now you've got two or three. How you held your body, your fear, your worries, all the activity you stopped doing, and that just compounds it. 
So it's very rare for me to tell people to stop doing things. It's very rare for me to tell somebody, I think this is not going to work out. And, and I, I talk to my therapist all the time. That's the art. That's a, it's a, I'm doing like rubbing my fingers together. I know it has nothing to do with science. It, it's more just, you know, dancing around the science is what I do. It sounds like jazz. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds yeah. like, it sounds like you're, you've, you don't know the song, yeah. and then you start playing it, and yeah. oh, this is how this song goes. I know how this song goes. I know the scales yeah. to play. I know I know what to do. I know the boundaries that I need to keep in here. Yep. That's what that that does resonate with me. Yeah, personally, <laughs> like when I call because I did experience that. Yeah, and um, I started to feel, I could tell that I was having anxiety about yeah. not knowing what to do. Right, and that it was making it worse. And then when you go and you find the diagnosis and it, it doesn't give you any solutions, then it's like, oh shit, I'm going to have this the rest of my life. And it's so rare that anyone has anything the rest of their life. It's just so rare. The musculoskeletal system is constantly adapting and healing. It's, it's re- I, I'm, I can say bold things to people because the majority of times that's how it is. People think that, oh, I have back pain, I have the rest of my life. 90% of people get better. It's like ridiculous, and yet that 10%, they seem to scream the loudest, so everyone's like, oh, I have an uncle, and he's been you know, in a wheelchair. People don't go in a wheelchair from back pain. The way the nerves work out, you can have a weakness in a muscle or two, but you never lose all your legs, and if you do, it's such a rare thing. I've never treated it in 22 years, so it's that kind of rare. And I wonder if this, uh, because this your body's going to fix itself. Yeah. An intuitive way you feel this is why people in your family live so long. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. yeah. Farmers. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. true because yeah. you can't. You yeah. like, I have to. My grandfather, he had torn his rotator cuff like working with bales of hay and he was eating dinner at our house and he couldn't lift his hand to his mouth. And I'm like, what's up with your shoulder? Oh, I heard that a few years ago. <laughs> Jeez, did you go get looked at? Ah, I don't have time for that. So he just kept going. It's he just used funny. his other arm. It's yeah. making me think of my parents because my dad came from farmers. My mom did not. And so my dad doesn't, like, if I something bothers me, I kind of give it some time. Yeah. Because I've experienced this where I go to the doctor and they tell me something yeah. when they don't really know. Yeah. And then I feel like, oh, I have this problem. Yeah. But if I just give it some time to work itself out, yeah. it's usually it'll go away. Right. And my dad gets that, but my mom will just have this anxiety about like, you have yeah. to go to the doctor. You have to figure out what the problem is. Yeah. Like my rule for if I'm sick is I, if, if I don't have it for three weeks, uh-huh. it'll go, then it's, it's okay. not anything I need to go yeah. to the doctor for. Usually seven to 10 days, but <laughs> <laughs> 10 to 14. I don't know, you, you know, yeah. the flu might last yeah. a couple of weeks, but then it goes away. Yeah, yeah. It kind of runs its course. And then yeah. It's, I'm, I'm along the same line there. I don't. For, for years, I didn't even go to the doctor. I shouldn't say that out loud, but, <laughs> but it was more like I, there was nothing to go for. Mm. And so people go to the annual checkups, and I really think they're valuable. But I also I think it's even more valuable for people to really pay attention to what's happening to themselves. And, and probably the best scenario is doing both. So yeah. you have the feedback. Because we do know if you catch things when they're small, they go away quick. So bad things like cancers and things like that. If you wait and, you know, the wait and see attitude and it's been a couple of years, it can be too late then. That's true. And I have tons of patients that, like, they, they had a real injury and they thought, I'm just going to wait and see if it goes away, which is fine for a couple of weeks. But we're talking, like, six, eight months of, <laughs> like, now it's a mess because now not only do they have the original injury, but they've been walking funny. So mm-hmm. now we've got to deal with the problem at the foot and at the hip and the knee is so, so there's like that. I would encourage people. And as, as a profession, I'm, I'm trying to start the process of telling this community like capital district, go see your physical therapist and just have them evaluate it and tell you nothing's wrong. And part of the reason it's not, I'm not definitely not discounting physicians. My God, they're, they have so much knowledge of the really, oh shit stuff that, that this is also the physical therapists that work for me. I'm amazed at what they know because I don't know that stuff. So my training, I have a master's in physical therapy and it was a great program and I have no, no beef about it, but my PTs are talking about stuff. I'm like, I don't know what that is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, you can pretend like, oh, yeah, yeah, and then go home and read it like, oh, okay, I know what that is. But the truth is, is that I I am like really basic, simple. So muscles hurt when you contract them, when you stretch them. Ligaments have an event. 
You know, it's like you, I just go through. So you have, in order to injure a ligament, you have to have done something. So if you wake up in the morning and you say, oh, I sprained my ankle. Really? How did you do that? So a, a ligament is an ankle sprain. So you, you know exactly what happened when it happened. And if you don't have that, I can take ligaments off the table. And so you can go through the process of just the basics of bone, muscle, nerve, things like that. And you can say, no event. The number one reason for back pain is no apparent reason. So people are always looking for what I did to make my back hurt. And most of the times they're not going to find it. And the thing that they find isn't it. Mm -hmm. So for example, I have people say, I did yard work. Oh, when was that? A month ago. (laughs) That, That ain't it. It's really, it's remarkable. People think that they did something unusual. I, I was trimming the hedges. Oh, when did you do that? Literally, it'll say a month ago. It has nothing to do with the pain today. And in the notion, it's it's that example of the ankle sprain. You roll your ankle, you know I rolled my ankle. There's not like three days later, hmm, oh, my ankle's hurting. So if you have an event, then you can get really specific about the injury and what musculoskeletally is going on. And And that honestly is where I live. So when I'm asking the questions, I'm asking, is this a joint? Is this a muscle? Is this a ligament? Is it a nerve? Is it a bone? That's it. And the rest of the stuff, the oh shit stuff, what I can tell is if it's not that, it may be the other bad stuff. Hmm. And so I can eliminate, and I'll, I'll tell that to the patients, that I can tell you what it's not. And the longest it's going to take me is a couple of weeks, and I can tell you what it's not. And just by going through that process, check it off. If it's a muscle, it's going to respond this way. I anticipate you coming back and telling me X, Y, Z. And if it doesn't do that after a few tries, then I know, okay, let's put muscles on the back burner, move on to the next one. And you just keep going through. And and again, that's what I learned at the McKenzie method because it is or it isn't. It it is a ligament. It is a muscle. It is a nerve. It is or it isn't. And so if if it is that, then it should respond as you anticipate. I really like that idea that you said. I think you said about the McKenzie method that the solution is in the patient. Mm-hmm. The, like that resonates the has with all the me answers. because, yes. it, I mean, sometimes I can figure out what's going on. For sure. Once in a while, usually, you know, it's probably because I've had diagnosis of things through my life as a kid yeah. that I realized didn't mean anything, yeah. and I figured out. Like I had a lot of stomach problems when I was younger, and I figured out in my twenties. I'm just stressed out and I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not relaxed and <laughs> right? I'm, and I'm, it's hap- that's making yeah. me all tense and I'm not, yeah. um, so I figured that out and that's why the cluster headache diagnosis, yeah. it took me maybe a week to realize that doesn't mean anything yeah. because it just feels like another one of those right. catch-alls. Right. But, uh, the other thing is that it makes sense that the solutions would be like all of the answers are in right. whoever's yeah. body is hurt because- that's whatever the cause is, is, yep. is in, in me. Yeah. It, so he, the teacher, our teacher, David, would also say that you come to a conclusion when you're tired of asking questions. Mm. And in the medical field, that is a very common habit. So to take the time to keep asking the questions when you're not sure, and again, to be very hyper-focused and, and to keep really narrowing it down, getting more and more precise. So someone gives me a response, I fine-tune the question to see get deeper, deeper, more and more specific. Yeah. And and it requires practice. So I'll hear my therapist asking a question and it's it's a fine question, but I'm I'm like puzzling like wh- who cares? It's like it's not that's not relevant today. And it's very very common especially with new therapists to ask a lot of questions about how it's been over the last few weeks. And I'm less interested in that. I'm more interested in how is it right now? because I have no influence over the last few weeks. Now, it's not that I don't want to know that because that becomes, it paints a picture of what your life is like so I can guide you as to, you know, avoid this, change that, that kind of thing. But I want to know right now. How are you right now? And not, I I practice this and I would say a strong majority of the time I'm good at it. There are times that I get lazy myself, but is to really keep the patient coming back to that too because the tendency is to say, it's going to be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and it's really not. And just as a like a really kind of annoying thing, our body is completely different today than it was yesterday. Mm. So the cells of our body are dying off, and so you can't even say that you're the same physical structure today that you were yesterday. And that's literally happening all the time. 
And so when people would come in and they would talk about these pains that they had for the, you know, 50 years, and it's the exact same pain, it's not physiologically possible to be the exact same pain. And what it is, is the memory of something. And then when you repeat the memory, that memory, um, the pathway grows stronger for that, but it's not even true. Mm. So our experience of what's happening is always delayed. So it's not even happening right now. It just happened. It just happened, that kind of thing. And so I, I worked with chronic pain patients for a number of years, not by choice. It just, I, I attracted them into my life somehow. And, but it was good because I, I really, again, honed things and started to, to find, I like to break up people's beliefs. So if you come in with a strong belief, I have a cluster headache, then I try to figure out all the things I can say to show you how it's not that. And if it is a cluster headache, fair enough, it is, and we'll treat it that way. But if I can find one gap in it, then I know, okay, there's something else here, and we've got to dig deeper to find that. And people are very protective of their diagnoses. So I have a, a gentleman right now who had a herniated disc 30 years ago. It's not there anymore. So the body has healed it, and there's all kinds of data that after three months, most people's discs, like a 70%, are completely healed. So the notion that I have a herniation from 10 years ago and still have it, it's not likely the truth. And in that amount of time, degeneration has taken place. So a bulging disc is, is um, so the disc is kind of like, um, uh, it's in the middle of it, it's a consistency of toothpaste and it's kind of like, um, how do I describe it? You know, people will use examples like a jelly donut and stuff. It's not <laughs> like a jelly donut, but the disc has a thing in the middle called the nucleus. And then the outer portion of the disc are these little rings that go around. And the rings meet at 66 degrees, which is interesting because it's where it's at the strongest to absorb forces. It's similar to corrugated cardboard. So corrugated cardboard has a stiffness to it. Flat cardboard just crumbles up. So the little holes in the corrugated cardboard, which gives it stiffness. So the disc has these little rings that go around and they, they meet at 66 degrees. Makes one a triangle. Goes, yeah. So one goes clockwise and the other goes counterclockwise. And they keep meeting at those angles to provide that. So if you took um, a, a compression and you compress two vertebrae together, the bones will break before the disc does. But just like with corrugated cardboard, if you bend in the front, it'll collapse. So if you put a shearing type of pressure on corrugated cardboard, it'll just topple over. Right. But taking the, the pressure vertically, it, it can stand it. So just like that in a disc, when you sit slouched all day, your vertebrae are pigeoned or pinched together, and they start to shear on each other, causing degenerative things to happen in there. And what happens is when you squeeze in the front, it acts like toothpaste, so all the pressure goes back. So that nucleus starts to get pushed backwards because the nucleus is thicker than the outer portions. So it's kind of like a P that's getting pushed in there. And so eventually what will happen is the wall will break down on the back part, and that's where the nerves to the disc are. So that's where people feel a little pain in their back. That's the first time. So the first time anyone's had pain, that's what it usually is. So there's exceptions to that, but that's the most times. And so then just by doing the opposite movement, you can move the fluid away. And as time goes on, that will continue to accumulate and the back wall will stretch out, bulging disc. If it continues to stretch out further, you have a herniated disc. So when that happens, people will have severe pain and sometimes they'll get nerve pain that goes along with it. But over time, they don't stay in that position their whole life. So the body will heal it. It'll start to migrate back. It'll try to mend it up. And then if you look and took an MRI, most people years later, it's different. And this is an extreme example, but I had a gentleman who had a disc that had dropped down two vertebrae levels, which is massive. So it herniated so far that instead of being out at its level, it had actually dropped down the spinal canal and gone down two separate levels. I mean, it was enormous. And he refused surgery because he'd had a surgery in the past and it didn't go well. I saw him years later and he brought in the MRI and showed it to me and the disc was completely healed. And so that massive of a herniation, which is the biggest I've ever seen, um, that healed itself. And it was him persisting. Did he have pain? Yes, he did. But he kept moving, he kept doing activities, and the body healed itself. And in the U.S., we do more spine surgery than the rest of the world combined. And so if you just think, we're 300 million, there's 8 billion, <laughs> and we're doing more surgery than everybody else. And part of that is pay, Americans are wimps, and they're, they want... 
immediate fixes. And they think that having surgery, I can't tell you how many people have surgery. And they th- I have a woman right now who thinks if I have surgery, I'm going to be fixed. And I'm thinking, no, they're just going to remove your disc. You got a whole ton of other things going on here. That's not going away. And it's possible that it'll be worse. And I don't, it's hard for me to say that because she's in agony right now. But it's like, man, oh man, that's a big jump. Hmm. And it's only been a few weeks. And then one of my therapists told me she'd worked with her last week and she was improving. And I'm like, oh man. So when it's really bad people, I get it. It's, it's awful. And it totally takes over everything you can think about is nerve pain. And yet, man, give it some time if possible. It's, I get why it's not, but I can tell you if she lived anyplace else in the world, they wouldn't even talk surgery. Yeah. And I, that's the problem. I did rec- realize at some point that every time I went to the office, you guys asked me, how do you feel today? And Sometimes that's frustrating because I want to do something, but mm-hmm. I feel awful. Yeah. And a couple of times when I said, I don't like everything hurts. Yeah. I didn't do much and they just kind of gave me a massage. Yep. And as much I resisted that, but uh-huh. I felt a lot better afterwards because I was where I am. Yeah. So that whole being where you are and then the breathing, it sounds a lot like meditation to yes. me. Like being yeah. now, yep. being now, where are you now? Yep. Because if you can be now, you can kind of allow your body to do what it needs to do. Your body's doing what it needs to do without you. <laughs> we just get in the way of it. Yeah. We like resist yeah. it. Yep. It causes more pain. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And Actually, I, there's another thing I wanted to, because I, I, I do, I agree that like physicians and doctors have a place that I would never want to live absolutely. in a world without them. And right. I have a great example. I went to um, a cabin over the winter and I got this splinter in my foot that was just ridiculous. Yeah. It went through my sock. It was huge. Yeah. I was limping. I, I was cutting my foot open trying to get it yeah. out. And I thought I got it all. Uh, but after limping, limping, like really limping yeah. for two or three days, I went to a podiatrist because yep. I thought either either it's still in there or I have a really bad foot problem. And I, yeah. I, I don't want to walk wrong because I know that's going to cause a other thousand things. other problems. <laughs> yeah. And he said, it's really good you came here because... Yeah, and he, he said, I would have had to cut you open anyway, and it would have been a lot harder yeah. for me to get it out, and then the recovery would have sucked. A lot longer. Yeah, yeah. so he just, sh- which was the worst pain I ever felt in my life was the Novocaine being shot yeah. in my foot, but uh, <laughs> yeah. worth it. Yeah. Um, so there, there are, like, it's really tough to know. Yeah, and the other, to, to just defend the physicians, they have a couple minutes, and so I have, I can make it, I own the place, so I can make it as long as I want, but... You know, you have, I see a patient two to three times a week for four to six weeks. You can figure it all out. And if the doctor had that amount of time with them too, they'd figure out more than I could figure out. So it has nothing to do with that kind of thing. It's it's more their time is pressured. And they're really, big part of what they're doing is to figure out the oh shit stuff. So they're listening to see, is this cancer? Is this a heart disease? Is this some kind of obscure disease? I can't even tell you what it is. I don't, I don't know that stuff. Right. And so my niche is I know I'm good at what I do somewhat because I've been doing it for 23 years, a lot because of that teacher I told you about, because it really changed how I do things. Mm. But again, back to that science part, it's not, I, I'm like really primitive in what I talk about. Yeah. And so I even know when I'm writing articles and, or on the air that if there's a physical therapist listening, they're probably thinking this guy doesn't know what the <laughs> hell he's talking about. And there's some truth in what they're saying. And yet I know it's what the patient needs to hear, or I can sense that that's going to help them more than me saying to them that, you know, you have a herniated L4, L5 disc, like who the hell cares? Yeah. That, and, that just sounds scary. Yeah. And, and so that's, you had said something about that. Like we get in the way patients, people get in the way of the body. We're not doing anything to just, I mean, on the real primitive level, breathe, make yourself breathe. And so, yes, you can slow your heart rate down, you can slow your breath work down, but you can't make your lungs stop and you can't make your lungs go. They're going to do it completely. In fact, as soon as you get out of the way, they just go on their own merry way. And it's like that with everything, everything. And so I really, and, and the place I had before, the current place, we called it a wellness center. And so we did a lot of this kind of talk with patients. I don't do it as much anymore. And there's there's a lot of reasons why. There's there's a, there's things that happen to me personally that make me resistant or hesitant is a better word to dive into some of the things we're talking about. Because people, um, it, it's work to go into the 
the non, um, what was the word you said before the, your analytical, very scientific, rational. very rational. Yeah. Because when, because there's also people have stories and dramas that go around things and they have religious beliefs and they have cultural beliefs. And so you start to get that into the big muck and it makes, it makes for a mess. And so in that regard, that's what I mean by listening to someone, because I, I have worked with all nationalities, ages, every kind of um, belief system that you can imagine. And so it's fine with me. I can, I can dance in all of them because within that is my way of guiding you to the basic principle of you need to move or you need to stop doing this, but do this instead. And, and that's, that's not, I don't know. Like, so when I see physical therapists, I, I see how they process things and I really feel like I'm not a very good physical therapist, (laughs) but I really can tell you like, right. But I can tell, like, I can tell you how to get better more because I know that rest of it. That's the point. So I, I can walk where you walk. I, and, and, you know, like the, the chameleon kind of thing. I can talk to the most spiritual religious person and I can talk to the most country bumpkin redneck person. My whole family um, live in the country. So I have a whole bunch of cousins that I'm real familiar with that turf. And I actually like when the real smart, intelligent person that comes in and starts speaking a lot of big words, because I just start throwing Latin and <laughs> anatomy and <laughs> physiology terms at them. And, and I also know there's alpha males that come in, and I can present myself as a stronger alpha male and take over the room. But I can also be really bending and um, very zen and letting go and let somebody else have the way, you know, the bamboo thing. I can, I I very much can do that. That's great. It's kind of like dreams in a way because we all have them, Mm -hmm. but, and they must mean something. I mean, it must, it must be like, but it kind of is your own language. It's you dream in your own language. You, 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 your dream is not going to mean much to me. Right. And if it does, it's definitely not what it meant to you. And I don't need to have my dream influence you. Right. Yeah, you're, you're you're listening to my dream yeah. and under, trying to understand yeah. how how it impacts me. Yes. And then That's y- the using my own language right. to help me right. figure out what right. what it is that I I had a, a early mentor, he was a classmate of mine and he had such a good way of explaining things to people. So I asked him, you know, how he got so good at it and he said to me, I imagine that I'm talking to my dad and my dad's a blue collar guy. So if I can explain it to him, I can explain it to anyone. And so I took the same type of idea and I, I would figure I could explain it to my mom. And my mom is, um, she's a wonderful person, and, and, but she would, she would challenge me. She would question it. So I had to figure out a way not to take that personally. That's her story, not mine. So if she doesn't like how I'm saying it, it's my agenda. I have to change how I'm saying it to help her. So I let go of my way and find your way and whatever it is. I, I, I mean, I... Of all the skills that I feel the strongest in, that's where I feel the strongest with patience. That's, I mean, I find that difficult to do. I mean, I know exactly what you're describing. Yeah. Because I know for a fact, just even outside the physical therapy, yeah. but in the helping a person, yeah. you can't help a person who, who you you can't do it for them. No. And you, you don't get to decide the no. way they do it. You don't no. get to decide how they figure it out. Right. I can know exactly what someone's problem is. Yep. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If they don't know what it is, right. I I can't there's just a there's tell a famous them. quote my, my teacher David talked about and it's it's um it's something to do with you're getting someone to have their your way, but they think they're doing it. It's their way. <laughs> and it's some like Winston Churchill quote or something like that. That's that's diplomacy. And, and that's like these, these little things, all these mentors that come along in my life and, and those mentors, the ones that I admired the most were the ones that could communicate the best to the patient and, and, or were incredibly calm. And so there is, I don't get rattled. It's, I mean, I shouldn't say that because something will come tomorrow and will rattle the hell out of me, but it's rare for me to get rattled. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, a, a gentleman that fell. It wasn't my patient. It was one of my other therapist patient. But I just go over and I'm just talking to him. And part of that is because if I go over panicked and nervous, he's already scared and worried. So all it's going to do is magnify the problem. And so then I, I listen to him and how he's talking. And if he's already making jokes about it, then I start, you know, saying things like, I hope you didn't put a dent in my floor. So it just like, you know, breaks the ice and he's not worried about it and say, you know, just take a minute and we'll get you up. He, I don't think you can get me up. I can get you up. 
Okay. If I have to get three people or I get a truck in here, I'll get you up. Don't worry about that. So, but it's, it's, and then at the other end, there could be someone who's really scared. So I'll just sit down right next to him and just breathe with him. And there's a, I don't know where, I'm trying to think where I, that comes from, but there's something about when you're around somebody else that's really common breathing, you're, you'll start to breathe in sync with them. And there's like a triggering reaction. So I practiced breath work for years. So you had mentioned meditation and things. And I would go into a private room at my last office and just literally breathe and meditate for five minutes in between patients to make sure I was calm inside. And then what started to happen to me kind of spontaneously is when the, the stress would come up, I would just start to be breathing. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't because I was trying to, it was because I'd practiced so much. So in those moments, if I'm calm, the person next to me is going to calm down. And I actually, I had a a therapist that worked for me for a while and we would practice that. We would get the people that were really excitable and tense and worried and fearful. And he and I would just really practice our deep breathing, grounding, and just to see like as a game that can we calm this person down without talking to them, without touching them just by us being calm. And it was really remarkable to see the impact of it. And it, it definitely, I mean, most people who have kids will know this. If a kid, child goes down and you freak out, it just makes it worse. But if you're calm and you talk in that calm way, the child will kind of follow along. Well, it works for adults too. Yeah. So it's a, I, it's the same with dogs. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, absolutely. And, uh, girl, like if you have a significant other and they wake up in the middle of the night with in bed with you and they had a nightmare. Yeah. And they just grab you. Yep. They can't. Just talk and you're not to you going to make it. them better no. by saying it's fine. No. You're safe. It's but if just, you just lay there yeah. and you stay relaxed, and relaxed and calm. They, they, Amen. Yeah, it yeah. works. That's really yeah. interesting. Yep. I did. It does resonate because actually last night I was I. I I started to realize recently that when I get a headache, I think I'm giving them to myself because something happens and I get nervous. Yeah. About a headache coming on. You're thinking too much. Yes. That's what headaches can be. Yes. Yeah. And so there is something like I, I my posture isn't yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. There's I'm a physical component. It. Yep. But uh, so I'm whatever my body's doing to help me with that, it yeah. doesn't feel great. Yeah. And it happened last night. I was laying down and I thought, oh God, it's starting to happen again. I'm getting yeah. all nervous. And then I th- I just took a breath. Yep. And I just felt like I'm out of my way. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually here now. I'm not thinking about what if, what if, right. what happens now, what happens next. Right. It's going to be like it was before. Right. And my body just, it did what it did. I went right back to sleep right. and it was no big deal. So that's the difference between pain and suffering. Pain is a physiological re- reaction. Suffering is a mental. And there's another thing, like some of the reasons why my staff will do the manual work, there's a few things. When We know that when people are touched, it calms them down. So it depends on how you're touched. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but the other thing is that I've taught them specific points. And some of the points that are up around the head, for example, the base of the skull to the trap is a gallbladder meridian point, and the gallbladder represents frustration. And so it's a very common thing for people to come in who are frustrated, who also have headaches. And is it the frustration or is it the headache? Is it both? It doesn't matter to me. I just know that if I push on those points, it makes the person relax and feel better. It hurts like holy hell at sometimes, but... And then the other part is that there is a physical component. So back to my teacher, it is or it isn't. So if we have a headache that is cervicalgenic in nature, then it's going to respond to cervicalgenic treatment, meaning we can do a mobilization to you, can do some exercises for it, and it will respond accordingly. And if it's not that, okay, fair enough, but now you know it's not that. And then you can go to number two. And in this particular region, that is thinking too much. So that would be the first step is what you just said, start to take some breaths, come back to this moment, not worried about the future, but right here. And then there's also the potential of the eastern side, so the acupuncture point. So again, the gallbladder. And there can be times where you have an organ that's not working properly. So I have a patient who has a um, had a kidney disorder and her kidney meridian is is like, any, you push on any spot and it's it's like a rock in each spot and there's a tension that's held there. And that's weird because that doesn't match anything physiologically. And yet, if I walked into there and just pushed and didn't know she had any problem with her kidney, I could say, oh, something's up with your kidney because it's so clear. And so when I have patients, I'll mention things like that to them just to see if, it, if there's a reaction from them for that. 
because if there's a reaction of, oh, I've been really frustrated lately, or, oh, God, I'm so frustrated, then it becomes something you can do. You can do something about your frustration. You can look into it. Frustration is a, is a buried anger, so you're angry about something. And that's, so you start to look into the anger of what are you angry about? And it's not a, a looking at it to try to make it go away. It's more to look at it to see what it's showing you. And a lot of times people are trying to make these things go away instead of listening to the lesson that they're trying to teach you. And if you start to listen to, le- and it's not easy. So by the way, that's not an easy thing to do, but, but that's ultimately why things, I believe why things cycle back around. This so, is resonating with me, very, yeah. like, especially the, I'm just trying to fix it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm yeah. not listening yeah. at all because I. And, and that's something that could be all it took is just that little piece. And then the rest of it becomes easy. The shouldering is shouldering burden. It's carrying the weight of the world on your back. So those kind of things are all upper back and neck. The lower back is and hip is support. And so um, if you're not being supported, you're not supporting something you want to do, people will have manifestation of symptoms in the hip area. The knee is moving forward. It's the thing that leads our movement. The foot is also similar. The calf is lifting yourself up. I mean, they have all these different hands are holding on. So I had this time where I was having like ridiculous hand pain and I couldn't match it to anything necessarily physically, but I'd been holding on to the story of my facility. My facility in Gloversville didn't end well. Um, It didn't end terribly, but it didn't end well. And so I held on to story for a long time and I would find that I'd get more and more frustrated that, you know, and my hands would hurt more and more. And that f- my friend who I told you, the, the physical therapist, massage therapist, asked me, what am I holding on to? I'm like, you're going to hurt your f-, you know? <laughs> and then, but then it's, it's revealed and it's like, it's something minor, but hurt feelings and um, an old story that I was still stuck in. And that's what I'm holding on to. And then you can't make it go away. So it's not like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. It's more that every time it comes up, then you can start to evaluate, is this something that's still happening? Is this something I want to deal with? And then it starts to soften. And so through that process, it's it's exactly the same for the upper back and neck. It's, It's listen to what it's trying to tell you. And if you can do that, I really believe, I know, I've seen it again and again, the solutions come way faster. And it's when we try to fix it or make it better. Again, trying to make the body better. Get out of the body's way. Let it do what it's supposed to do. And people think of pain as a, as a negative thing, and I, I do understand that myself. But it's it is a guide. It's it's neutral. Mm. Pain's not. It's nothing. It's a physiological response. Nothing more. The suffering is the mental part. That 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 what you said about the distinction between pain yeah. and suffering. That's something hard to accept. That yeah. Because you're, there's an implication there that suffering you're doing to yourself. You are. <laughs> pain is something that happens to yeah. you. Yeah. And it's not intentional. So it's not meant that you should, you know, beat yourself up. Oh, I shouldn't be doing it. It's more to recognize it because it's it's like everything that that too is if you try to force it away will linger longer. Yeah. And so it's really just acknowledging it and and trying to be open to it. I have all these weird stories of things that have happened to me personally and, and patients and it's really just recently that it's this this curiosity of, oh, I wonder what it would be like if I did it differently. Mm-hmm. And all this time trying to make it so because that's how I want it to be. And it, it, it's not working that way. So then the question, what if I did it differently? And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, there's 10,000 possibilities here. And it's it, it took me years to get to that point where I was ready to like, and, it, and people have asked me, I'm sure, before, but it's just... Oh yeah, this could be different. Wow. So I'll give you a quick story about that. I when I went through the closing of the facility there, I also my dad had been diagnosed with cancer. My wife was having weird blood work. Our finances were in disarray because of the business. It was like this really terrible time. So I had gone to a a teacher and 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 asked about that and and I said, "It feels like my life is falling apart." And his what he said to me was, "Did you ever consider your life's falling together?" And it was just, right. And it was just like, oh, no, I never thought of that. And so the people that I had felt betrayed from in in different situations, it was, did I really want that person in my life? And if I didn't want them in my life, then why am I holding on to the fact that they betrayed and left my life? So when things got hard for me, I was looking for support. And some people couldn't because they have their own agenda. They have their own life to do. So it's it's not my, I shouldn't expect it from anybody kind of thing. 
And I had lots of people who stood behind me and, and supported me. So it wasn't that I was like left out on an island someplace, but I was fixated on the two or three that had treated me poorly. And the fact is, it is better that they're not around. And so is that life falling apart or is that life falling together for you? By going through that situations, was it helpful? Yeah, it was helpful. Absolutely. That's like uh, one of the problems of human nature because our we've kind of evolved to to notice patterns and want to find a pattern. Yeah. So if something doesn't feel right, we want to I think I think we tend to hyper focus on yeah. all of the bad things trying to look for which of these bad things what why are all these bad things happening? Yeah. And uh it happens on the internet a lot, I think. I yeah. I think that the internet is is a double-edged sword in a lot of ways. There's a lot yeah. of good, but if somebody's if if you have like a lot of really nice comments or something and one person says yeah. something mean yeah all of those other comments don't matter anymore Absolutely. they're out they're gone and you'll yeah. hyper focus on why does this person not like yeah. me why does yeah. why did they have to say that mean thing to me i i have a patient it's i just today this this happened months ago but i had a patient that came to me a few years ago and was having groin pain and he had had a slip and a fall and it seemed like just a strain of the muscle and he absolutely responded to the therapy. He was incredibly grateful. I went back and looked at the notes. That's how I could say that. And he was like, it was wonderful. And then uh, a year or two after that, he'd had another event, a, a funny step again, groin pain again, similar symptoms, similar response. And in my note, I had put down there that there was a pe- the a possibility that he was having some hip joint problem too, that it wasn't just muscular. So I had said it and it's what I would because I went through a big process with this. It's very unusual for me to write a note and put that if it if it wasn't something I said to somebody because I don't just I, I write as little as I possibly have to. So, anyways, he sent me an email that he was angry with me that I I didn't tell him to get an X ray because he had a hip joint. He ended up getting hip replacement, and he blamed me for losing two years of his life. And and this comes from I can tell you countless people who have said literally the exact opposite, that I saved them, I helped them, I, you know, whatever, was great that they met me, blah, blah, blah. That one patient, this was like literally months ago, and as recently as this today, it triggers up inside me. And and part of it's good because now as a result of that, if someone comes in with groin pole, I check the hip joint. So it's it's a benefit to the people after him. It wasn't for him, but it was, it's one of those things that there was like, to defend myself. There was no reason for me to think that because there was no other indication other than the location of his symptoms and a a mild, um, so I do this test for hep joints and he had a mild um, symptom response. So that's why I put it in my note that there might be some hip joint pathology, but I, I really did not suspect it. I really did think it was soft tissue. There was, I missed it is the bottom line. And, and yet again, I can tell you countless stories of the opposite where I was the one to help somebody figure something out because of all the things we're talking yeah. about. But man, that, that it bothers me to the point where I, I want to fix that. I want to go back and change that. I want to change me to know better before, which obviously I can't. Um, and yet again, for the future people, it really is a benefit. And to suggest that I haven't made mistakes. Oh my God, I made, well, everybody I still do. Right. But it's, it's because, I think because, um, especially as I've gotten older, I really have more and more people counting on me to figure out things for them, and I like the role. Mm. So there's a doctor in, uh, in orthopedic that when he's somebody has gone to different people and he's not sure of it, and the therapist, the chiropractor, whoever's not sure of it, he makes them come see me, even if it's an hour or two hour drive, because he wants me to figure it out. I love that role. Because I want to go through all the things and clear out the dust and say, and I say that spiel of, if I can't figure it out, in two weeks' time, I'm going to tell you what it's not. Yeah. So we can get them off the table. So I'm not, I, I don't mind the pressure and the people counting on me for that. But man, that one's going to bother me for years to come. I have another one that it was probably six months out of physical therapy school. It was a woman that, she was 23 years old. Um, I can picture her, her name was Amy, and she had a a torn meniscus. I didn't know it at the time. So the doctor wanted me to get her knee straight. So I had this, it's called a slide board, it's basically just a piece of wood, and I had these straps, and I would pull the straps down to try to force her knee to get straight. And she would just cry the whole time, and I hated it. Every time she's on my schedule, upset stomach, felt awful. She'd come in and I'd try to be upbeat and all that, but I hated it, hated it, hated it. 
And, and I, I also thought this was stuff I'd learned, by the way, this wasn't me coming up with this brilliant idea to do this. And I thought to myself, this is barbaric. And we have, there's a joke about physical therapy is the torture room and stuff like that. And, and I was just like, this, this is insane. And right around that same time, I had other patients who had knee replacements and the same type, I'm like pushing on these poor people and they're squealing in pain and tears coming down. And, and I'm told you have to do this because scar tissue is going to form. And if you don't do this, you're going to screw them up, blah, blah, blah. It's such bullshit. Their scar tissue doesn't form overnight. It takes six weeks for scar tissue to mature. I had six weeks time mm. and I'm sitting here, you know, urgently and I'm, you know, being angry at patients and all this after my McKenzie program, I, I, Actually, before I stopped doing it, I I was the therapist who would close the curtain because I didn't want anyone to see that I wasn't doing it anymore, and I would have the patient doing things on their own, and I was getting as good or better results. So I started to learn early. I don't have to do what everybody else is doing. I don't have to do what the trend is doing. And McKenzie, by the way, his his genius, in my opinion, was that in the 1950s when he came up with this idea, he was back then. You weren't supposed to bend backwards. It was bad for your back. So he had a patient that was uh, named Mr. Smith, and Mr. Smith had sciatica, and so McKenzie had him come lay on the table, and it had been elevated, so his back was arched, like bending backwards, and the sciatica went away. So the genius of McKenzie is, even though at the time it was bad for you, he listened to the patient, and the patient got better. And the second genius is he experimented on people. Mm. So he took the same, like he'd take the history, and he'd try it on somebody else. How do they respond and then by doing that, he developed this whole system and it literally changed how we treat the spine. So now everybody knows in the medical world knows the McKenzie method. And that was because some guy in the 1950s did something against the trend and he went off off on a whole tangent away from what everybody else right. was doing. But it wasn't like a, and it, I'm going to go against the no, trend. It was no. a, it this the patient. seems to be what's going on It helped the person. patient, right. And he found out it didn't help all the patients. So by doing that, he was able to experiment and see that it doesn't help all the patients. So, that is something I wish like regular people, like, you know, it's if it's taught in your, I feel like that would benefit people in general right. in everything in life, just to think of things as, because I find that most people go to the doctor for a for an answer, and they're mad if they don't get one. Right, but but that's not what the doctor is for. No, you, no. you go to the doctor to find out if yeah. you have something terrible. Right, right. The and, oh shit. Yeah, but yeah, that people want MRIs all the time, and we know that there's there are false positives all the time. So now more and more. Uh, results are coming out that if you took normal people who don't have any symptoms, they have torn labrums in their hips and their shoulders. They have torn rotator cuff muscles. They have tears in their glute muscles. That makes sense. Her- right. Herniated discs all over the place. And so what's more relevant is you have a symptom here. And so then again, through process of elimination, we can eliminate what it is. But there's things that that I try. I go out and do uh, talks and workshops, and I try to educate people to talk to the doctor in their language. Because if you go in, for example, and you say that my shoulder's bothering me, that's your neck. That's not your shoulder. But if you say the word shoulder, then the doctor's going to evaluate your shoulder. And if you go in and you're rubbing your butt and you say, my my hips really bother me. Nope, that's your back. And so if you don't use that word, it's not to blame the doctors again because they're listening to you. They're hearing what you're saying. You want an answer about your hip. So if you say the back, now all of a sudden you're pissed off because I came here for a hip and now you're telling me it's my back. And you don't really want to know the answer because you've heard Uncle Joe has a bad back and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's so funny because the human body is way more complicated way than more. like plumbing or right. your electricity. Exactly. But if... Your electricity, if your outlet's not working, yeah. and the guy goes, oh, there's something wrong with the with the box, Yeah, you don't fight that. Right. Oh, that makes perfect sense, of course. Yeah. But with their own body, we think... Right. So the, the, the famous stories are, you know, we had um, one, of, one of my mentors and teachers going through, this was years ago, but he was famous for treating a professional baseball player who had shoulder pain. But what he saw was the guy's ankle wasn't working properly. So the, the baseball pitcher would step off the mound and his ankle was bothering him. So he dropped his shoulder, shoulder hurt. So the therapist didn't work on his shoulder, worked on his ankle and the shoulder pain went away. And it's that kind of stuff. Like it, it makes perfect sense when you get the whole picture. It totally but, does. But the, the patient was upset at him because he's like, I'm here for my shoulders. Like, I know, what'd you do to your ankle? He's like, I don't care about my ankle. I sprained it six weeks ago. That's your problem. Mm-hmm. No, I can hear from my shoulder. Okay. Let me work on your ankle, see how your shoulder does. It's more common now, but I can tell you, like me going through 
like this is what I was saying earlier that it's a lot of trial and error for me because I didn't have those teachers I, like they were just doing it at the same time they were stumbling onto things and now I've I can tell you that story but I had a patient that came in who had fractured his fibula in a snowmobiling accident and the fibula is the bone in the outer part of your lower leg and there's a few muscles that attach there one of them is called your perineal longus and that goes down the outside of the lower leg crosses over your foot into your big toe So this guy came in and he would walk with his foot turned out. And every time he would step, he was fine. But if he turned his toe into a normal position where he'd have to put weight through the base of the big toe, he'd feel pain in his calf. So it's because that tendon goes all the way up and the muscle belly inserts up there. So every time you you plant the base of your big toe, the muscle's contracting up by your knee. That's the muscle belly. The tendon goes down to the big toe. So that muscle belly had to contract, and that's where it it fractured. So I went through, I literally had my receptionist that I was, it was very quiet at the time. I just opened the business, but I had her videotape him doing all this weird stuff for 30 minutes so I could figure out what evoked that pain. Because I knew if I could evoke that pain, then I knew I was addressing that muscle. And if I was getting that muscle, because there's different things we learn in physical therapy school to to address that specific muscle, and those exercises weren't that great at addressing it. And yet walking in a particular way, it would elicit that response every time. So you know those two purple lines in my uh, on the carpet? and yeah. That's why they're there. So because I had him walking with his feet close together, and that would elicit the response. So when people come in and they have a problem with their hip, their knee, their foot, doesn't matter, We toe out, we turn our foot out. So those lines are just to teach people how to walk normal again. That's actually exact same thing happened to me because I I started running in my late teens and uh, I started getting hip pain in my mid twenties. Yeah, and I and I found out. I actually went to a physical therapist and they uh, they were like, "Well, your IT band is a mess," and they they were. My feet, I ran like this. Yeah. I forget what that is, like overpronate or yeah. something. Yep. And I, I taught myself yes. to put my feet back. I remember I would I would go for walks on my lunch break yeah. and just try to every couple minutes, yeah. be like, where are my feet? Push yeah. them back, push them back. And so the reason for the lines is because I had tried to teach people that stuff too, and I found it was just easier to say, walk inside the lines. That's all I have to say. That's crazy. And so then after I, I stumbled onto it, I happened to be listening to NPR, and there was a a woman on there who was a, I think she's an acupuncturist, but she'd had back pain and she'd written this book. And so I went and got the book because I, I like the spine and I'm kind of a geek and read that kind of stuff. <laughs> and in there, she did this anthropological review. So how primitive man walked and primitive man walks with a single pathway, meaning their feet are, they're not tandem, but they're close together in a, a single path. And then modern man has this towing out and we wobble side to side. And that can be at least in part why we have back pain. So here's this woman who goes through and she has this, it's like uh, uh, fossils of the a primitive person walking, an early man walking with a child and their feet pattern are that pattern. And it's from like 7 million years ago. And so here I am in the clinic, you know, in 2015, all I needed to do was look at a picture from, you know, 7 million years ago, but it it was the process of me and the the difference. Why do you think we walk like that now? There's a lot of reasons. Um, Cosmetic? No, no. Well, yeah, there's a part of that. It's a great observation. So part of it is that we do copy our people. So if you're a child, you copy your parents. So why people walk similar, say it's all genetic. No, they're mimicking how you're walking. So that's that's in part what she's saying that as culture's gone on, we follow that same similar pattern. But I noticed this is a kind of a long story, but I had a um a patient with back pain that came in had sciatica and they had walked with their foot out in that position. And we did our treatment and their pain was had abolished, but when they walked away, they still had that gait. And it was one of those moments, this was like 15, 20 years, nah, 15 years ago. And it just is like a little blip in my brain. You know how you have these like, pay attention here. Yep. And then I didn't notice anything like that. And then I was down in um, Saratoga and I had that guy come in and I noticed it in him. And I was like, I've seen that before. And then I started watching. I would go home and I'd tell my wife, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I'm just watching people walk. And I mean, I would have people do laps and I would just be looking like, dumbfounded. I don't see anything. (laughs) There's nothing for me here. And then that guy came in and it's like, oh, wow. So I played around with him. And then I started doing that with other people, just as like McKenzie. So you had one person success. Let's try it with everybody. 
And, um, and by doing that, I started to realize that that pattern, that's, that's how we hurt, walk when we're hurt for some people. And it's unilateral. And then the, the, I mean, everything started to change for me because people who have knee pain, people who are diagnosed with pronation. It ain't pronation. It's because they turn their foot out. They have people who have hip problems. Again, it's not the hip. It's because they had an injury to their ankle years ago and they walked that way. And then I had this patient that came in who was a runner and she was having problems at her hip. And so IT band, that's how the diagnosis was. And there's a muscle right up by the pelvis. So I was trying to push my thumbs in to do the release. And she said, it's not enough, push harder. So I literally put my fingers on her pelvic bone to drive my thumbs in there. And she said, that's it, that's better. It wasn't the thumbs, it was the fingers on the pelvic bone. There's a muscle right in the pelvic bone called your iliacus. And then right above the iliacus is where one of the abdominal muscles comes down. So when I was gripping there, that's what I was gripping on. That's the relief, it wasn't the thumb. And so then I started to look into what the hell does the iliacus do? The iliacus joins with a muscle called the psoas to the iliopsoas. And so the psoas gets all this, all this press. And yet the iliacus, I found, had way more relevance, especially with that weird gait pattern. And so, yeah. And so then I, I, so I, was, I was doing this work on an anatomy professor, and I told him that's what I was doing. He's like, you're not in my iliacus. You're on my external oblique abdominal. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> He's like, uh, yeah, you are. So I went to the gross anatomy lab, and sure enough, there's the external oblique. And so then, now I'm in a space right now where a lot of people are talking about the glutes being so weak and how we sit on them and how we do all this mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm wondering right now, so the glute medius is a muscle that's, you know, I don't know, size of this can, and it has a tendon in, in your butt, and it controls how our hips sway back and forth. The external oblique is a muscle that attaches to your pelvis. It goes all the way to the front of you, to your rib cage. It goes up underneath your armpit, around your back, and down towards your butt. It's this enormous muscle. I mean, huge. And so, and it attaches to your pelvis. So when your pelvis is dropping, is the little tiny glute the one that's really holding on? Or is it that big, gigantic external oblique? So when we do the manual work, I'm pushing on the external oblique, and I've been playing around with it a lot lately, and I'm finding more problems there than I am in the other muscles. So I wrote two articles. I called it runner's hip, and I was part of this running cohort, and they got mad at me because we don't need another name for a condition here, you dumbass. <laughs> so, But I called it that because I wanted to have something written down that other people could test out, like yeah. Mackenzie did. So I wrote it down that way, and and now after going through this, I've written two separate articles as I get more clear. My first article is okay, and I explain it, and I go back and say, what I've learned since then is I was wrong about that. It's really this. And now I have to write a third article and say, well, I thought about the first two. I was completely wrong. It's really this. But I'm going through that's, the process. That's, that's like... It's the fun part for me, too. It's the geeky part. Yeah, yeah. and you know, a lot of people I talk to um, have the same frustration I do where... I want to be treated like I'm a mystery, you know, uh -huh. you know, and or whatever I'm doing is a mystery and you're a detective. And that's yes. kind of what you're doing. You're you're yeah. you're like I need to rule out this. Right. I need to figure out is this is this what that is? Right. No, okay, let's try that. Right. But you can't get to that w without yeah. this error phase where yeah. you you're, and, and the the truth is that mistake that happens, that's the most important thing because in that then for me anyways I, I have a hard time living with them. So it, it drives me to not make that mistake again. So all those mistakes I made early on, I'm like determined not to. And that's where like when I'll say things on the radio about don't worry about icing the knee after a knee replacement. Hmm. And that's heresy. I mean, people are like, what are you talking about? And and I, I've actually backed off on on being bold about it because I got such, such people fight over it. Like, <laughs> okay, ice, it's not doing it damn thing for you but what if you about want to, heat um well it's compression so i wrote an article heat versus ice is the title of the article and i said choose compression because compression is better than both so ice is a vasoconstrictor which means it slows blood flow down so you have a big swollen knee why are you trying to slow the blood flow down so people say so it doesn't get more swollen it's already swollen person so if you... This resonates a lot with everything else you're saying. Yeah. This is what your body's doing. This right. Is, so, and, and there used to be like, don't do anti-inflammatories, or they say do anti-inflammatories, but now the, the popular belief is don't because there's a reason for the swelling. So instead of trying to stop the body to do what it needs to do to heal, try to assist it. And what we know is that compression doesn't stop inflammation. It stops how big it gets. 
I'm going to reference you every time a girlfriend <laughs> tells me because I I have a I I do if I don't like to take anything mm-hmm. unless I absolutely have to yeah. because I can't function and I have to do something. Yeah. Because I I I think of it as getting in the way. You know, it's like absolutely. I'm going to have to deal with this at some point. Right. I just can't right now. Yeah. So I'm putting it off. Yeah. But yeah, you usually like my mom will be like, "Well, you take some Advil." In. Yeah, it's not that bad. So I don't you can to. start talking to mom about how devastating Advil is to your gut, and so I don't take it for that reason because yeah. I have a gut. Yeah. I have a gut. It's problem. not so. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. There's a time and place for it, and I've had abscess tooth where I thank God there was some kind of narcotic or some strong medicine to take the edge off. Absolutely. But as soon as I took the edge off, I got off of it and got onto the Advil or the Tylenol because I didn't want that crap in my system. Actually, the first time I took it, I threw up because I'm, I'm not good with <laughs> medicine. But but anyways, the point is I, I try myself to get off them as quickly. And as soon as I learned about how negative it is to the gut and how bad it influences down there, I'm like, that's where our immune system starts. So why are we messing with that? I, I've gone through different things, and I'm not advocating this, by the way. This no, is, I, yeah, uh, <laughs> got to get myself in trouble. But it's it's I, I have a similar philosophy, and I have people who pop the pills because it's too much to take not to. And I do understand pain. I mean, I've I've broken bones. I've had I've had horrible pains in my day, and yet I I would still try my best not to do it. When I had the abscess tooth. <laughs> I, I take little baby aspirins and I would break them on my gum line, hoping to get it directly into the blood system around the tooth because I didn't want to take the other medicine. Wow. <laughs> little baby aspirin. That's not smart. <laughs> and it didn't work. But that was like, that's how averse I am to really strong medicine. I don't want to take it. And yet I have patients all the time that I would say, man, you need something. I told the woman this morning that she needs to find a, the doctor to give her a muscle relaxer because her muscles would not let go. Mm. She has nerve pain right now. And I, I'm not supposed to say things like that. And yet I can't, it, it just kind of bumbles out of my mouth. No, I get you. And then I'll say, I may be wrong. Yeah, talk to your doctor because yeah. you I, may I, not be able I, to. I have but. the same thing because uh, I had gut problems when I was young. I had yeah. like ulcers and acid oh, wow. reflux. And yeah. So I did a lot of damage to my esophagus. Yeah. And so I have to, if I have to make sure that my esophagus doesn't get damaged anymore because it's starting to grow back yeah. improperly. Oh, so. Yeah. I do take, I take a, uh, either, I used to take, I think, uh, I forget what it's called, a meprazole, which was like an acid suppressant, yeah. and now I'll take a Zantac or something, but yeah. I switched because I talked to my doctor because the one was a preventative, yep. and I had to take it every day, yeah. and I said, I just, I don't like this, it, it's just, it makes me feel anxious that yeah. I'm taking a pill every single day, Right, right. Uh, and he thought, I agree with you, take this instead, just take it when you need it instead, yeah. but really take it, because... Yeah. You can't afford to, right. you know, if you have heartburn, you have to take this. Right. So yeah, there's definitely like a time and a place for medication, but I don't, I don't know if, if you know, I mean, bodies are in pain a lot. It just, but I'm learning that as you yeah. get older, like yeah. things just hurt sometimes. Yeah. And I have found that taking, like I said, taking the medicine only puts it off yeah. because I, it's whatever was happening, Right. it's going to happen again later. Right. And if I take the medicine, if I don't need to, then right. I'm better off not. Yeah, and I have those patients where if if they've crossed too far of a threshold, they need something to stop it from snowballing out of control. Mm. And by all means, let's get on it. Let's stop that momentum. And then as soon as it's stopped, okay, let's get off that again. And I've also been talking a lot about the anti-inflammatory diet for people, just nutrition in general. For the I'm same purposes. In it. Can you give a little, like, uh, just like a spark notes? You know, yeah. what, what is what is an anti-inflammatory diet like? Um, fruits, vegetables, and the I hate to say whole grains because I I know some people aren't good with grains because of gluten and things like that. And then some lean meats like the turkeys and chickens and things mm. like that. So inflammatory foods are processed foods and uh, refined foods. So like sugar is. There so, are a couple things I know bother me. Um, deli meat bothers yeah, me right. really badly. Nitrates. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's uh, an inflammatory food. Yeah. Yeah. So I try not to eat deli meat. Yeah. Um, I sh- sugar. I love it. Yeah. But um, I don't need it. You know. Yeah. So that's one that I know bothers me if I eat too much of it. Those are the two I think that are the worst. For I've me. had a so the hand symptoms I was telling you about. I've had a couple really bad episodes and 
the the uh, last two I had are I feel definitely associated with crappy diet. Mm. And my brother came home and I was eating you know Oreos and pie and you know drinking beer and all that and yep. and I didn't feel well at all. And the last one, quick. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so I've been really modifying my diet um, because number one, it sucks to wake up in the middle of the night and the first thing you notice is your hands are hurting. Oh. And yeah, and so I and I blame the patients because I kept I do it as a joke too. It's all the damn patients here. But um, but it, it wasn't it wasn't an overuse thing. I had all this time away where my my volume with the patients diminished, and yet my hands were still hurting. And I was like, wait a second. And then the other one is there's a lot of people out there, not a lot of people, but there's been people I've I've worked with who have Lyme, and so I was starting to wonder if I had something like that because my joints were hurting, and that's one of the things Lyme does. So I had blood work and it came back negative, but my inflammation level it's supposed to be like a three. Mine was twenty one. And that's what can happen for sugar and processed wow. food. So I was a little off the, wow. the charts there. Yeah. So I go to the doctor on Monday, actually. I'm really curious because I want to get another round of blood work to see has it come down and where I'm at because I can tell physically I feel better. So, and the other thing is like now that I'm, I'm 48 and my body doesn't respond the way it did. And it, it really was hard for me for a couple of years just realizing I don't recover quickly anymore. Oh, wow. So okay. it's not delayed like a, someone that's elderly, but, you know, like simple things. Like I, I was working out with my kids. They were at the age where I could start doing things that I thought were fun, too. So we we're doing all kinds of plyometrics and jumping and running. And and I was like, I was waking up. I barely walk out of bed <laughs> downstairs and stuff. And, you know, the first couple of weeks I hadn't trained. So I thought that's what it was. And then it kept going. And I was like, something's wrong here. And there was a therapist who was working for me at the time. He's like, you know, you're over 40, right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, so what? He's like, you can't do that, you dumbass. You're not a teenager. And so I had to modify the intensity of my workouts because I was not recovering. Yeah. And so then it, it got a whole head game for me because, well, that sucks. That's no fun. And it's really just been the last like six months that I'm like, you know what? I can still do quite a bit of stuff here. Yeah. So why am I acting like I'm an old man? I just can't, I can't dunk a basketball anymore. Okay. Right. Um, I have so. a, so yeah, um, balance is a very key connecting thing with all of these things. And it's making you, what you're talking about is making me think of my relationship with diet because I was very overweight when I was younger, like yeah. huge. And I lost a lot of weight yep. and then I wasn't eating enough. Yeah. And I, I had to find this way yeah. to be healthy and, I didn't feel good until I surrendered to the idea that this is always going to be something for yeah. me. Like, uh -huh. and so sometimes people will criticize me. They're like, "You're always doing something with your diet." And I'm yeah. like, "Yeah, I know." Because, I, I mean, I, I, it's not enough for me to have one thing. So, yeah. right now, I'm for a long time. I was uh, intermittent fasting without realizing it. I yeah. just, I just felt better when I didn't eat all day, and then yeah. I ate reasonably when I got home. Right. And I felt good. And people were like, you can't do that. It's not healthy. Yeah. So I trained myself to eat food. <laughs> yeah, during the, the five day. times a day yeah. crap. Yeah. I never bought into that one. Uh, so it didn't make any sense to me. But it wasn't, it was more just like, uh, for my, my own personal, I, I could, if I, if I start, if I could do that, it would be with like sweets. I could do that all day long. But the other kind of good nourishing food, I didn't, I, it's hard to do that. And I, mm -hmm. I never, so when I, <laughs> my pregame meal in, in college for basketball was a, a pizza and a two liter bottle of Coke. And then the, the breakfast was like a dozen donuts. So, yeah. and that I could, I, I was good though. I mean, I could do everything I want. I wasn't though. It was terrible. But, but the, as I got older, I remember people, I remember having an argument with a personal trainer over that and like, you know, we should be doing five times a day. I'm like, no, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. And they're like, well, you got to keep your blood sugars. I'm like, what? Who has a problem with the blood sugars? It, it just never made sense to me at all. So Yeah, yeah I think there's certain things that may, maybe, maybe for people who are extremely active, you know, like hikers, you're, you're like, if you're on like a 10-day hike, yeah, I maybe understand eating yeah. a little bit throughout the day. But yeah. most of us don't live that way. I, and, I, I, and, and it's, you're right. There's a time and place for everything. Yeah. So there's going to be like people who are doing those 
uh, Ironman triathlons, yeah, they need to have nourishment through the whole event or they're going to crash. And the way we found that out is people didn't do it and they crashed. (laughs) So we do know that that's necessary, but that's extreme. Yeah. And someone who's working out for an hour in the morning, they don't need to be eating all day long. That's the other thing. I feel feel better when I exercise have on after a fast, you know, like maybe, maybe I have a, a little thing if I'm really feeling low energy Yeah. or I prefer it if I haven't had anything to eat right. yet and then I exercise. So I, I try to um, recognize when something's out of whack. Yeah. So like maybe I'll notice, I'm not noticing that I'm full when uh-huh. I'm eating. So that means, okay, we're going to be a little more regimented about when and how much we eat yeah. until I'm back to where I feel full. I don't need to eat anymore. Or, yeah. or if I notice I'm eating too much sugar. Yeah. So I'm going to not eat sugar for a while yeah. and then, you know, it comes back. But the thing with balance is, and this took me a long time to realize, was I've, I've, I've used this analogy of like walking on a balance beam. Mm-hmm. If you find balance, that's good for a moment. Yeah. But you kind of got to let yourself get out of balance yep. in order to move forward into the next thing. Right. So it's like I had a problem with being too regimented and it's, well, now I'm stagnant. You know, yeah. I'm not actually moving. I'm just holding this position. Yeah. And getting really rigid yep. and no, 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 no. I have to let myself get a little out of balance right. and then go a little bit in the back and the other way. And yeah. then, uh, then I feel good when I yeah. can do that. I, I use that same type of analogy with patients because that's exactly what it is. It's a little bit of back and forth. Sometimes I call it the roller coaster, co- coaster so you're going to be up and down. It's, it's really rare that it's a straight shot and it's really rare it's spot on every time. And so it's, it is that dance back and forth. That's, but learning that dance and then reassuring people that that dance is okay. So they don't have an expectation that it's going to be okay every day, all day. Yeah. So, and, and, but that's life. And and the thing is though, everybody knows this because other body parts that don't concern them, like people have this, this bum knee that they've had for 30 years and they wake up every day and it's stiff and sore. They don't care anything about it. But then one day their neck is stiff and they're like, oh my God. It's like, (laughs) the joint's a joint, man. So why do you care about the neck more than you do about your knee? And yeah, I do know why, because it's new, so it shouldn't be there because it never was before. Yeah. That's the one of the most common things. Well, I never had this before. <laughs> like, yeah, you never sprained your ankle before until the day you did. So it's like, what does that mean? It's yeah. completely irrelevant. It's, but, it's a lot like the error thing. You know, you have to make mistakes to learn. Of course. And that's really relevant in my field. I'm a software engineer, yeah. and I've had this conversation with many people. For a while, I wanted to teach. And uh, I was tutoring the students in college who were not going to do it as a major or were maybe considering it. They weren't really as, you know, into it. Yeah. And and I could feel their anxiety and their sort of tentativeness about it. Yeah. And a lot of the things was just recognizing, oh, you're terrified to make a mistake. Yeah. But you're not going to, you're not going to figure this out. Yeah. So I, instead of attacking them on yeah. like, well, this is what you did wrong, I would yeah. just say, oh... That's interesting. What do you think is happening right there? Yeah. What do you think that is? Right. And then they, they would explain it. And just yeah. explaining it to me, yep. they'd figure out what they were doing yeah. wrong. Yeah. And and oh, it's yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. I made yeah. a mistake and that's okay. Yeah. And the same thing, even software engineers who get paid for it today, is, uh, sometimes uh, I'll have this conversation. I got I got this from my friend Ramon. He was like, we're engineers, but regular engineers make physical things. You know, yeah. if I make a bridge, it has to be right. Yeah. But I'm making an electronic bridge. If it falls yeah. over, it's not going to hurt anybody. Yeah. So we have this awesome benefit where we get to build the yeah. entire thing and stress it out to see right. is if it's like the greatest thing in the world. I right. can make a million mistakes and not harm anybody. Yeah. And I learn from every single one of them. Right. It's Imagine if you could do that with the human body. Yeah. You know, just, well, we do, though. I was just thinking of some examples that are similar to that because people will come in just petrified to do an exercise because they don't want to make themselves worse. But in order to get to the facility, they had to get up out of bed. They had to put their clothes on. They had to go to the bathroom. They had to drive in the car. All that physical activity to physically find themselves in the clinic. So getting up and down from the toilet is a squat. It's a sit down, stand up, in and out of the car, on the table to sit down to have the meal. So they already done 15 squats. The research shows we bend forward two to 3,000 times a day. So just think of all the times you have to bend down to get something, put your clothes on, brush your teeth, all that is forward bending, reach down to the cupboard to get something, bending over to the sink to get something, getting in your refrigerator, it's again and again and again. But in the clinic, if you ask someone to do 10 bends, they're like, oh my God, I'm going to hurt myself. Nope, you've already done it 4,000 times today. You're going to be fine. People are afraid to walk. They walked in the clinic 
I had a woman today who walked from the parking lot one end all the way into the clinic, and I wanted her to walk like the length of the table. And she was like panicking. <laughs> like you just walked 500 feet and 10 feet. You can, and you got to walk out by yeah. the way to get your car. But I, I don't tease them and I'm just making light of it right now. But it's the, the, what I'll say to them is you're safe. So I remind them it's okay. And, and I'll have somebody who doesn't like that they're losing their balance. A lot of old people, when I put them in positions, they feel unsteady, out of balance. And I tell I'm doing it on purpose. That's how your body figures it out. So what you just said about if you stay in that confined tight space, what happens with people with their, their literal balance is they're afraid if they start to go outside it because they feel unsteady. So they get more and more confined. And the more confined they are, the harder it is to step out of of that space. So they had this range that was huge they could do when they were younger and it's just shrinking, shrinking. And they get nervous about it. So they do less, which makes their balance worse. And it's that, that same thing. I have lots of patients who come in who have knee pain when they get up and down from the chair. So they stop doing that or they'll boost themselves up so they don't have to go as low. And then it hurts to do that. And they just keep on going the wrong way. And I make them do the literal opposite of what they're doing. Why? Because it's safe. You're not going to injure anything here. Right. Does it hurt? Yeah. So I say all the time, safety and, and injury are not the same thing or mm -hmm. safety and pain are not the same thing. You're going to do this. It's going to be completely safe but it's probably going to hurt. Yeah. And so, but telling people ahead of time that also it reassures them, but I'm constantly pushing people on even a massage. Absolutely. It, it hurts. Yeah. It hurts yeah. to have, even though it feels good. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. It, it doesn't always feel great. We do that to get our anger out though. So sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to ask a question. Sure. Um, so when I, I, uh, I never really thought about things very much. I started running and I didn't stretch and then, I started lifting and I didn't, you know, I didn't, wasn't doing anything. And then I went to yoga yeah. because I realized how inflexible I was. Yeah. And while I was there, I had this thought. And I think it, I think I told you about my friend does the um, functional patterns thing. Same yeah. thing. I think it, the, I realized in all of them, in the physical therapy, same thing. A lot of what I'm doing is unlearning bad habits that I, that mm -hmm. I developed without realizing. Yeah. And so my question was, and I've asked this at yoga too, like, if you have kids, what what do you, what can you do to sort of? I realize they're gonna form their bad habits no matter what, and you can't force your kids to be yeah. like little soldiers or anything. But yep. what can you do to sort of help, maybe prevent a little bit of it? Play, 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 yeah, play as much as you could possibly. That's do. a great answer. So the the it's it's a very common thing that's happened, and it, there are some some indications that it's starting to change, but. We have a lot of people who are afraid of kids getting hurt. Yeah, and, we do. And that, unfortunately, is where kids learn physically how to move, how to get balance, how to get coordination. And what I see, I remember this very clearly. I had a patient, this was probably 10 to 12 years ago, and he was an exceptionally good baseball pitcher. What was weird is he didn't know how to cross midline. And what that means is to take your right hand and put it on the left side. So when he would go up to throw, he was so stiff and his whole body would turn as like one unit instead of the big rotations that we have. Really? And that's because he never learned how. And it's like it's over coaching somebody how to how to move instead of and, and my kids went to the a school called the Waldorf School and it was this brilliant game to to count. And they had a little stick and they had to reach with their right hand to grab the stick. So they had to cross midline, grab it, and hand it to the next person while they were counting. So their brain's going like mad, and the motor control of it, they knit. So knit is fine motor. So my kids have beautiful penmanship, which no one gives a crap about anymore. But they have coordination, and, and their games are all designed for that. But beyond that, most, not most, but it was a, a very popular thing if you had a child that was good in soccer to have them play soccer all the time. And it's one of the worst things to do. There's higher injury rates for people that do one sport all year round. In my day, it was, I rode a bike. So I learned to ride a, that bike my dad made for me. We had a little hill by our barn. And I, I was like literally four or five years old. And I went up on this little hill. I held on the handlebars and I coasted down and ran into the wall. I fell over. I put the bike back up. And I did that repeatedly until I could turn away and, and balance myself for a little bit. And then I tried to pedal and fall over. And in one day I taught myself to ride a bike. Now I might be exaggerating, maybe it was two days, but it was a very short amount I taught myself. So I got the coordination, I got my rhythmical movement and things like that. 
And I would climb trees and I would jump out of trees. And I mean, my brothers, we all played sports and things like that. And one big one is on a, on a hay wagon, taking a bale of hay. There's like a six inch gap that we're stepping on. The baler's in front of us. The bale's coming out. We're standing on this little balance beam, you know, a staggered stance, diagonally reaching to grab this hay, lifting it up over our head to put it up on top of there and realizing the coordination strength, core strength that it takes to do that. And I have a friend who he's, he's my height and he can bench press like 200, uh, 273 pounds was what his like workout was. My maximum was like 250. And yet on a basketball court, I could throw him around. It was like a bale of hay <laughs> yeah. because I had a center of gravity. I had balance. I had coordination and things like that. And that's what kids need. Yeah. They need to go out, play, run on rocks, jump off of them. And, you know, those kind of activities where you don't, where a parent doesn't interfere. No, 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 don't climb there. It's more, you know, if you're going to interfere at all, then just talk about, just be smart here. So yeah. you don't let your kid walk out in front of a car, but you don't have to freak out either. You can just say there's cars coming by. So every time you come here, you got to look. And that kind of thing, enough repetition, a kid's going to understand they're going to look. If you freak out, then they get that reaction. Yep. And there's so many, I had a, <laughs> my son was playing soccer and there was, uh, there's two stories. I'll tell you, there was one boy and he was a little bit on the heavy side and he did not know how to run. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. He had like this stiff shuffling kind of thing was how he ran. And I was, I couldn't figure it out. Like I, I, I told you, I love watching people move. I couldn't figure out what the hell the kid was doing. And then, and during one of the games, I was always the assistant. I never wanted to be the head coach. So I could make sure kids were getting subbed in so kids played equally. I always felt in like rec soccer, you should have everybody playing. It shouldn't be like the best kids out there all the time. And so I try to sub in everybody equally and distribute them around the field. And I remember the mom coming over to me and being upset because he was out of breath. And I was thinking to myself, like, I, I was literally perplexed. Like, he's playing soccer. He's been running. I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I think he needs a break. He's winded or something like that. I'm like, you know what soccer is supposed to run? You're supposed to be winded. He was like 10 years old. And that's a problem. That mother is the problem. And the other little boy had zero interest in soccer and the mother saw that I was talking and playing with some of the kids and she wanted me to coach her son to play soccer and I remember thinking to myself but right now he's like nine or ten years old he just run it's fine he doesn't need to know every <laughs> skill development type of thing and I said if I get a minute I'll I'll show him but he was literally the kid that was picking the flowers and stuff zero interest in, in soccer and the mom wanted him to play soccer so bad she brought he hated it there was, and all that did was teach him, I'm never going to play soccer again. And it's those kind of things, like it doesn't make any sense. If mm -hmm. a child's express interest, feed it to them. They want to do this sport, go for it. Every sport you can possibly imagine, get mom and dad out of the loop. And if they can't do that, my brother's a phys ed teacher and there's, there's all kinds of information about this. And as a physical therapist, motor development is so important. And the playground is a time for play. And in schools, we reduce the playtime down to 20 minutes. Same and the right, kids, yeah. they we know this though. We know that after exercise, they get their heart rate up. They're better focused. Their retention is better. Everything academically is better. Back to the Waldorf school, the kids went out multiple times a day. Mm. My wife is from Denmark. After a main lesson, every child goes out after one lesson for 45 minutes before the next lesson. Every lesson. So wow. if you have two lessons in a day, three lessons in a day, you got a 45-minute gap in the middle where you're outside running around. There is no in-day in Denmark. They have rain suits because it rains all the time. They're out, doesn't matter. They don't have snow days. My yeah. wife couldn't figure out. She actually took our kids to school <laughs> on a snow day because she didn't know there was such a thing. Mm -hmm. And she went to the school, and the janitor's like, there's no school today. She's like, why not? He's like, it's snowing out. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and the other time she did it, it was cold. It was like below zero or something like that. So she got the kids all bundled up. We had these huge down blankets, and they would ride in a – we had an old-fashioned um, – stroller that's what they use in denmark but they have like mountain bike bike tires on them so they can go over any terrain so she's got these down blankets all for, just a little eyes here peeking out and she walked them to walk them to school <laughs> not drive them walk them to school and the they're like what are you doing here lady <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> and my wife was the one that was in the middle of winter riding her bicycle to the grocery store in snowstorms and stuff and people were like what the hell's going that's on hilarious yeah but take a look the danish population healthy active, relaxed. They're always in that top 
five of the happiest people in the world. Mm. Some of it's because they don't have to worry about healthcare. Some is because they have a place to live, but also it's the activity. These kids ride their bikes to school. Yeah. Five years old, the endorphins that come from the cardiovascular exercises, the chemicals that are released for pain control. By the way, you want to reduce your pain? Exercise. Mm. If you have depression, anxiety disorders, exercise works better than the medication. The medication has a shelf life. And there's people who need to be on the medication to get them over the hump so they can exercise and they may need it to regulate things, but to depend on it. We know this. We absolutely know it from study after study. And yet, what do we recommend? Johnny's misbehaving, no recess. Which is the worst thing to do. And I have a teacher that, uh, she's a retired teacher, and when she had that child, she made him run. That Go. I was, I was just going to say, when you're misbehaving, why not be, go run. The, yeah. We had the 300. Like, yeah. Go run the 300. Yeah. Absolutely. But I also like, I grew up in the seventies. So in the seventies and eighties, in the seventies, we went outside all the time. I was just going to say that because, uh, I grew up kind of right before everything kind of, because I, I I spent my childhood in the neighborhood. I remember my mom would whistle to get us to come home for dinner. And, uh, my mom would kick us out of the house. Honestly, I remember being a kid and coming in complaining that I was bored. Yeah. And she said, great. I have chores. It took me one time to learn not to go in the house. I had a moment once where I was driving to my parents' home, and I just realized, why are there no kids anywhere? Yeah. There's no kids oh, anywhere. So, right. So we, my brother, he built basketball hoops. So again, this landfill, this is where he got all our supplies. So he went to the landfill, got a big metal pole, put a piece of plywood up on it, made a backboard, and then attached a rim to it. So the modern day basketball, portable basketball rims that all the kids have, my brother invented that in like the 19, late <laughs> 1970s, early 1980s, honestly. And so we had a, a gym teacher as a neighbor and he had this metal pole that came up with this metal loop around it. It was a rebounding rim to practice pulling the ball out. We used it as a dunk hoop. So we'd have this metal pole in the middle of the court and we, we had dirt courts, so we had this line drawn around. That was the three-point line. No backboard or anything like that. And it was probably eight foot tall, so a lot of people could dunk on it. But there's a freaking metal pole, not attached to anything. It'd tipple over on people. If you held on to it, it'd fall on you. So my brother built this backboard, and so we had full-court hoops. We had that metal pole and then a regular hoop. That's awesome. And it would topple over. My dad worked for Niagara Mohawk, so he had one of those big spools, and that would weight it down. Still topple over, so my brother tied it to the barn. And so then we wanted to have two backboards, so he built another one. And we would have these tournaments at our house where kids would come over. We lived in the country, so we didn't have like a neighborhood group of kids. We had like two or three neighbors. Hmm. But they would come to our house, and we'd have these tournaments. And we would play physical basketball. So we would beat the hell out of each other. And, you know, going up to dunk the ball and getting knocked by three people because, you know, if there was no blood, there's no foul. And it was just a really physical time. But then go on to a real basketball court. It, it's so mild, <laughs> you know. I yeah. got I'm the youngest, so I was I always had older brothers, and I had to go up against the older brothers, and so I was always playing against more physical things. But again, coordination, strength, agility, all that stuff. It came from play. It came from my brother going to the dump to get a metal pole to make this. My son. That's I went great. to play basketball at one time, and the rim wasn't level. He didn't want to shoot on it. <laughs> level rim <laughs> i had a metal pole boy <laughs> you know like what are you talking about but that's that is the generation for sure i do i love that answer about play because um i i mean I, I don't know exactly how i got into it but i was very interested in childhood psychology for a while and i read a bunch of on it and um, yeah. one of the things they talk about is the importance of play uh yeah there's a self-help book that came out in 2018 that i read a bunch of people i know read it uh he's big on the internet it's jordan peterson he's, yeah 12 Rules for Life, and one of them is Don't Bother Children When They're Skateboarding. Uh-huh. And I found that chapter very interesting. Yeah. I have a lot of the young cousins, and yep. uh, and it kicked me off on this sort of search, and I read another book called The Coddling of the American Mind and another book by uh, another uh, childhood psychologist. And all of them did talk about the importance of play from a yeah. million perspectives. Yeah. Like um, they said uh, you learn empathy through play because you have to – Kids, kids are more, more motivated by play than almost anything. Yeah. They'll do anything to play because yeah. it's what they love to do. And so, in order to keep the game going, yep. you have to worry about hurting another person. Yeah. Where in other situations you might not really when it's, need when to. When it's not structured, yeah, 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 not unstructured, which yep. is the 
the thing that I think is missing a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the books we that I read was about, uh, he mentioned how playgrounds are like yeah. unusable to yeah. children when they're there. It's like, wh- why? <laughs> why? Just yeah. just open it up. We had contests to see who could launch themselves the highest off the swing. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, sure, we broke some bones. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, well, kids get hurt. I know. It's, it is what it and, is. And I do understand parents not wanting their kids to be unbullied and unnecessarily treated poorly yeah. and things like that. I, I really do think I get that. And I can remember times growing up that there were times that kids were definitely getting treated poorly Mm. and yet i also know what you said about the games like my brothers i mean they they didn't let up on me and they would have very strict rules and all that but if i wouldn't play then they were going to accommodate it's just what you said yeah that there's an empathy there because they can see that it's pushing too far so they had to learn that part right they didn't do it a lot but they did do it sometimes it's it's weird i've said this to people because this when i had this thought once and it just shocked me and it was that you can't learn empathy by being empathized with Hmm. You know, because yeah. if if I if someone's always empathizing with you, you've yep. given them no reason to care about yep. you at all. Yep. But if somebody's a little more selfish, a little yeah. more like, well, I want to do this. Yeah. And you have to find a way to coexist. Right. You do have to empathize with them a little bit just to get keep right. things in a cooperative mode. Yeah. Yeah. I also I remember I saw this video once on this school. I think it was somewhere in Asia. That was a it was a round school and they had classrooms all around it. And there was just free, and there was jungle gyms and right. everything. And the idea was, well, if you can't handle sitting here anymore, yeah, go do go, go play. play. Yeah, and they found that the kids genuinely would just choose to go learn something right. because they had tired themselves out or had like, yeah. you know, found done what their body needed to do. It, it makes you, sense. Have you heard the book Spark? No. What it, it's about a phys ed teacher. I think he was in like Illinois or something like that, and he went to some kind of. Um, continuing education program and they gave him heart rate monitors and so he brought them back they were free so he had a whole bunch of them and he tried to figure out how to implement them into his classroom so at first what he did is he had people put them on and he was just you know checking regulating them and things and he learned that some of the kids that he thought weren't putting in an effort their heart rate was actually really high so they were putting in an effort to try to do what they were doing so instead of him being critical of how they were doing things, he just made it, if you want an A, keep your heart rate at 70, 60 to 70% of your maximum. And he would calculate with them and teach them how to do it. And if you wanted to be, this is, and that's all you had to do. You could do anything you wanted to do. You wanted to run in place, you could do it, you jump in jacks, you wanted to swim, whatever the activity was. And amazing thing happened. The discipline went to zero. Mm. No kids were getting in trouble. The academics went through the roof. So there was this big thing study with the U.S. compared to the rest of the world academically in sciences and math, and we did poorly. When he took the students from the school district out, they tested at number one and number two compared to the rest of the world. So it was one of those things like, is it because Americans are not as smart as the rest of the world? Is it because we're fat and lazy compared to the rest of the world? And then it's been duplicated multiple times where they put this system into play at other schools and the kids' academics go up, the discipline problems go down. And so he had a program where they'd come in before school and kids would start to show up before to run around and do exercise because they liked how it felt. Mm. And my brother, who's a phys ed teacher, he's opened the gym up and he'll have a whole, in the, before classes start in the morning, and he'll have kids that come in there too. And if you, if you give, especially younger kids, if you give them the opportunity to run around and play, they're going to run around and play. And it's when we tell them not to or we structure it too much, we get in the way. But that book also talks about the unbelievable benefits of continuous heart rate, keeping it up. And it's good for like multitude of diseases. We mentioned the anxiety and depression, but it's also good for obviously your cardiovascular function. So your heart, your breathing, but it's good for things, other diseases too. It's good for cancers. It's good for, it's like a whole slew of positive benefits that come just by getting your heart rate up. And then he has a follow-up book called Go Wild. I don't remember the author's name. And Go Wild talks about being in nature And there's studies in Japan where they take these stressed out businessmen and they take them to a park for a retreat where they still are doing business things. But just by going to the park, they have a reduction in their stress levels for an entire month afterwards. And they have all kinds of data about 
the person who has the heart attack and goes into a room that has no plant compared to the one that only has a plant, the one that has a window looking outside and the one that doesn't, and their recovery rates, everything is so much better. And we know this. We know this in nursing homes with the older people. If they have a plant around, they survive better. If they have a window to look out, they do better. And we still make freaking rooms with no windows, no lights, and no plants. It's mind-boggling. And yet, if you go to Denmark again, what you'll see in their their homes where they have the older people living, they're like little apartments with big windows, with lots of light coming in and plants everywhere. And I'm sure there's institutionalized things where they don't do that because it's it's more serious medical related. But if you have if you have an older adult or you have someone in your life that's been going through a tough time, get them a plant. You see in my office, we have plants everywhere. You do. Yeah, it's intentional. And it's not just it's not just for that purpose, but it also is good for the air and cleans out the you know our, our all the chemicals that are released. My God, there's so many things. There's a ton of books that I could refer you to that that talk about the environmental problems that we have in a house and the carpets that we use and the plastics that we use and all that. And we're breathing this in all the time. And 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 I know there's a big movement right now with this our climate change, and and really it's affecting us as well physically. We now know there's little pieces of plastic in every person and what's going to happen to our body because of it. It's a new thing. Our body hasn't evolved to have this. So what the hell is going to happen? That's we don't I, know. I was thinking about that the other day because, you know, they say that sitting is the new smoking, you know, that whole thing. Be- mm-hmm. And it makes sense because in the past 20 years, yeah, more and more people are sitting yeah. all day. But I think about, well, kids now have a smartphone at like oh, it's terrible. Five. We and, know that, and they're going like this yeah. all oh, day. Oh, have you seen that article? There's a there's a nub on the back of the head that's that's growing because when you have your head forward like that, the muscles contract, and it was the the Neanderthals that had it because they had such big heads, so the muscles had to grow to hold there. So because of that position of looking down, there's some kids that actually have like a bone growing out of their head from that muscle. It's That's got a crazy. name to it, but there's there's worse things because the light off the the computer is not good for the yeah. brain. The speed at which it's going, especially for young kids, again we know this from studies and things on how it's influencing brain development and otherwise attention span, things like that. And so our solution is not to exercise the kid, which we know works. We'll give him medication and give him a, a phone or a TV. It doesn't work. Yeah. So I read yeah. that book, The Coddling of the American Mind. The title's a little, you know, yeah. provocative. But uh, I, when I read that, I thought every teacher and parent should read this book yeah. because it's, you know, he talks about free-range parenting. So yeah. this, he has a child who, he talks about, what was her name? She was <laughs> she was in the news as the worst mother in America, and she just wore it as a badge of honor because yeah. her nine-year-old said, I want to try to get home by myself yeah. in New York City. Yeah. And yeah. she said, all right. Yeah, I'll drop you off somewhere. You have a quarter. You know how to find a phone. Yeah, you know how to talk to somebody and get help. Yeah, and he did it. And she said it was he had so much confidence. He felt so yeah good about it. And he talks about that and yeah. and how important it is to kind of allow your kids yeah to have some space to mess up and yeah. and to uh you know learn yeah. on their own without. My daughter flew to Denmark when she was thirteen by herself. And it wow. was, she wanted to do it when she's like 11, but we had to wait a little bit. But it's, you know, it's, it's, um, my niece and nephew had done it. My brother in law had worked in the airport. So he would, my sister and he got divorced. So he would, she lived in Florida, he lived in Boston. So he would go to the airport, give it to the flight attendant, the flight attendant would give it to the child to my sister. So I knew how that worked domestically, but I'd never, we didn't know how, it's the same way in, in uh, internationally. So essentially you go and you, you have like all this paperwork and stuff and the the flight attendant will take the child onto the plane and they sit near the flight attendant so they can keep an eye on them and then they hand deliver them to your mother-in-law. So it's not like that big well, of a deal, still, but though. it's still, and it was her idea. It was not our idea to do it. And we resisted in the beginning and my wife and I had these long talks about it, but it was my, my daughter was ready for something like that. My son wouldn't have been ready at the same age. Now he, you know, he's going out doing all Mm. kinds of stuff. And I, I encourage it because I, I, I tell my kids also that as they've gotten older, they need to learn how to do this stuff while they still have us. So, So it's like, it's okay to go out and try these things. But I will say it is very hard as a parent to let your child go away where you can't see them in a dangerous situation. Like my my son would, um, he, he was homeschooled from the transition of Waldorf school to the public school. And he had two buddies that he 
would walk with from class to class. So we had homeschooled teachers that lived in uh, Saratoga, so they would have to walk like a half mile to get to it, and there was three of them. And we weren't worried about them finding their way. We were worried that they'd forget to check and see if there's cars <laughs> coming and just be talking to each other, not because they were doing anything bad, misbehaving, but just like, hey, what's going on? And then yeah. meanwhile, there's, you know, right right out into traffic. But um, but we, you know, they they did it, and they did fine with it. And and my son would do that when he has, you know, when we lived in town like that, would do those kind of things. So, and, and yet I can tell you as a parent, it is very hard to do that. So I do understand why parents don't. But Even can, culturally, it almost seems like it has to be again, a cultural Denmark, thing. They, they're five years old riding to school on their bicycle yeah. by themselves. That was so. one of the things, his name was Jonathan Haidt. He's a social psychologist. And one of the things he said is one of the hardest things is my kids come and they say, everybody looks at me, you yeah. know, like there's no other kids who do this. Yeah. And right. he's like, that's true. That's, that's, that's a problem right now. I don't yeah. really know exactly how to do that. I right. can't convince right. all of your friends' parents <clears throat> right. to let them. So that, that's how it would be in Denmark if my kids went there is that they would be the unusual ones because all the kids are so used to just doing it. But even over there, like they, they go through this, um, let's say it's junior high school, and then they, they can stop school for a year just to take a break and then resume into high school. And mm-hmm. if they go into this high school part, they can choose a different town to go to. So they don't even have to live with their parents. They can go to a different town and attend that school. Some of them will take a bus there. Some will take a, a train there. Some of them will live in a different town. And we're talking like high school age kids. Wow. So I know. Isn't that wild? I and love yet, it and, though. I and mean, then my, I kind of wish that, I, that right. I was encouraged to do that. Because you, yeah. And it's it's the, the cultural. And then my uh, nephew, he was uh, he, he tried a couple different college routes and it didn't work. And now he's going to be graduating as a teacher. But he had a few years there where he his job, this is a great life, by the way. He was working a microbrewery in the summertime and he worked in the Alps as a ski instructor in the wintertime. Right. That's amazing. And, so, and no one was stressed about it. I don't know if his mom was and dad was, but it, it wasn't like a cultural stress. It was like he's 20 years old, so who cares? And then he got on with it, and he's going to be a professional. And his sister did uh, also went around a little bit, not as much. And she was now she has a PhD in doing international business. And it was like this: she went over to Canada to do school, and then she went to Vietnam to do some school, and then she yeah. went to Australia to do school. And it's just like that's that's normal there. And I know there are some Americans that do that too, but that's not the common way. And my daughter's applying to schools right now to go into it, and it's it's a. Uh, I want her to go to Denmark to do that. I want her to go tour around for a year. I feel like if because if I had kids, I think I would want. I remember when I was at the end of high school and this urgency, you know, yeah. that you have to go to college and you right. have to get this done. And I I kind of wish that it was normal to have two extra years, yeah. you know, to say you have six years to get four four years of school done. Yeah. What do you want to do in those six years? Maybe you yeah. want to take two years. Maybe you want to take one year to do something weird. Yeah. Just try it out. Maybe you want to take two years. Yeah. Maybe you want to do two and take a year. You know, I don't know, but right. have a, a buffer in there that isn't just school. Right. Something, go try something. Right. Go go off and, and figure out yeah. what life is. Yeah. Which again, in Europe and, and uh, I know Australia, it's very common for the kids to come up to Europe to go around and backpack and do whatever. So I, I went to uh, Edinburgh, Scotland and Dublin last year and I met two, two Australian people separately mm-hmm. who were, one of them was for a year. He yeah. was traveling for a year right. and the other one was six months yeah. and it was like, wow. Yeah. And they said, yeah, this is kind of what we do. It's normal. That's so... See, like, uh, again, to go over to Denmark, m- the trains can take you down into different countries, and, and you can go to see really cool things, go with friends and things like that, and it's it's pretty common to do. That's great. And I am encouraging my kids to do that, and having having been like you, I, I could not wait to go from high school into college, and I couldn't wait from college to get into the PT school, and I couldn't wait from PT to get the job, and I did all that, and I had like a lot of motivation for career and to had ambitions There's to There's external grow, so. pressure here too, though. It's not Not even... from my family, but you're right. I mean, there is, yeah, so culturally there is this yeah. expectation that... I don't mean that, necessarily family. Yeah, because yeah. my parents um, neither went to college, and they were happy that I got accepted without you know, a lot of struggle because my (laughs) brothers struggled a little bit, but you know, just, and then I chose a private school of all, all things instead of a state school. And, but again, my parents, I chose to play basketball. That's why I went to the college I did. It wasn't anything else. 
and and yet the the my parents wanted us to get a college education that was like a big thing in our family and so it was like um I, I almost just assumed that that's what I was going to do, but then in, internally, I wanted to I wanted to be the best kind of thing. So I wanted to push myself quickly into those arenas. And my first job, I wanted to I didn't like being the low man on the totem pole. So I went to my boss and I asked, "Can I go out and talk to doctors? Can I go out and do these things?" And then we we sponsored the McKenzie method there, and I went through it like multiple times in just a short span because we sponsored the courses and I would have a meeting with the boss and ask, I wanted to go to the diploma program and he'd say, I'm not sending you. And I was like, okay. And the next month I would go in and say, I want to go to the diploma. I'm not sending you. I'd literally every month and he got tired. He's like, stop asking me. I'm going to send you. I'm like, I'll see you next month. I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> and I just kept persisting. And then one day he said, okay, I'm going to send you. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so, and I, at the time I was actually interviewing at other jobs because I was not going to be the low man in the totem pole. And then when I got my, I worked with a spine surgeon for three years. And right after I finished my training, I had put my resume out there. And these, these people came after me because I had my diploma program. And I was talking to my, she was my girlfriend at the time, but I was talking to my wife and I said, I want a job where I make $20,000 more a year. I want to have at least six weeks vacation. And I want to be on the top. I don't want to be the bottom. I want to make the rules. I want to set the program up. And then I got call waiting. So I go over and it's this guy and he's offering me a job as $20,000 more a year is as much vacation as I want. Not just six weeks. I had as much as I want. And I was the first person in. So I had to make up the whole program there. And it was one of those moments like, are you serious? Like candid camera kind of thing. What? What? So I hung up and I said, I'll have to think about it. And I hung up. I called it back. I'm like, you won't believe this. So I took that job and it was, it was a profound experience. The surgeon wanted me um, because of my training, but he also expected me to be a peer with him in a sense that he would send a patient and say, am I missing something here? So my job was to do all the things I was telling you about. So right after my training and learning how to do it, my first job out doing it was for that same thing. And then we were so busy that I would have a full schedule and he would just drop 11 new evaluations on my lap. And so I, I had to get quick with my questions and get better and better. And the other reason, the other way I got good at asking the questions was I had a, a patient who was friends with Oprah Winfrey. I know she is in Baltimore when I worked there and she was on the radio with Oprah early on. And she was one of the women that read for the book club that Oprah had. And so she was my patient and she said, if you write a book, I'll get you on Oprah's show. So I started to write a book. I'm not a good writer. So it's terrible. And so I would travel in the car dictating what I was saying because I knew what I was saying to people. It would resonate with people. So I dictated it and then I listened back. It was awful. And so I realized what I was saying wasn't actually very good. So I'd practice how yeah, I said things. I have that experience listening to oh, this podcast. Yeah, yeah, over <laughs> and over. I'm sure. I, I don't listen to the radio anymore when, I, when I've done the shows, but I'm sure. And I also, I, I've been doing videotaping of my patients doing exercise to send to them for home program. And I'll notice, I'll say something like, okay, I want you to, and I just stop talking. <laughs> There's just nothing more afterwards. But by doing that dictation, and, and then I would write things down again and again. So when I'm talking to my PTs, that's the kind of level of nerd that I was. I mean, I was really analyzing everything I was saying, how I was saying it, the feedback that people were getting. Did it make sense? Did I explain it well? Could I explain it differently? And it's, it's become this obsession. And it started actually my first mentor, my very first job, he was a McKenzie therapist, and he asked me that famous question of, why are you doing that? And I gave me like the textbook answer, and he said, I don't give a shit what the book says, Matt. Why are you doing that? And it pissed me off, and I was honestly like pissed for a week over this, and I'm like at home like, who the hell is this guy? You know, <laughs> F him. And I'm going like mad at it. And meanwhile, what it did was it planted that seed, so why am I doing this? And to this day, as recently as that patient that I did the hip, why am I doing it? I missed something. It's every day. Every day I go home and, oh, I should have done it this way. I could have done it that way. And then I also started to notice these patterns develop where you'll get a few people in a row with a similar symptom. I always feel like life, God, whatever you believe in, it's showing you something. So pay attention. And I that's the, the, the runner's hip thing that I told you about is because I had multiple people come right in a string in a row and the gate with the weird walking mm. and stuff like that. 
And there's another one I, I, I stumbled onto this stretch we do for the lumbar spine and I called it the RPT. And it was a patient named Bernie who was a pain in the ass and he had a pain in the ass. And I did this stretch to him and it worked. And it was honestly out of frustration that I did this, this move to him. And then six months later, I had a patient came in with similar things. And I went around to my staff, I'm like, what did I do to Bernie? Because it worked and I want to try it on this lady. <laughs> and uh, eventually one of my aides told me what it was. He remembered most of it. And then I figured out, I remember the rest of it. So I did it and it worked again. So I had all my therapists, just like Mackenzie, I had all my therapists, every back patient that comes in, they have this, check their motion. If it does this, try this stretch. It's unbelievably effective. And so it's those kind of moments where you just, you, you practice, you realize you screwed up and you go after it again and you just, the trial and error bit. And it was, it's the repetition, but it's also that there's something in there for me that was, that's why I think the art of therapy to bring it back around yeah. to where we started from, that's how it all works. So even this, like what I do when I read is I'm reading about spark and I'm listening about how it influences kids. And then I think, well, if it's influencing kids, it's influencing adults. So now I have another piece to things to talk about. So when someone comes in and they're having a lot of pain, I encourage activity. It drives me batty when someone says, stop exercising. Why? Because you're going to get worse. They've been exercising to this point. You made that clear with me. Yeah. Because I, I said, should I stop doing yeah. anything? Yeah. And you said, do everything you were doing. Yep. If you feel something when it happens, yeah. don't do at that. At the time. Yeah. So the ankle sprain example, yeah. if it's going to bother you at the time, fair enough, we should stop. And if it's going to be in that time frame, you're going to know. Mm. And if it's not in that time frame, then it's not that activity. And I go through this over and over and over again. And I have a patient right now that, that he's so afraid to get going to doing things. He's been golfing like, I don't know, 10 times. It's never bothered him since he had uh, hip surgery. It's never bothered him, but he's still, today, this morning, asked, do you think it's okay I golf? I'm like, yes, it hasn't bothered you yet. It's not going to bother you. And if it does, just stop at that moment. It doesn't mean tomorrow it will again. You know, that makes but, a lot of sense for just how we evolved. Yeah. Because, you know, absolutely. In, in nature, you can't just be like, you well, can't. I'm not going to go get the right. food today. And that's the whole thing about pain again, because the pain is only... Only the alarm system to tell you that something's up. There's nothing more to it. And so as modern society has gone on, we've attached all these rules. If you go to Australia with lower back pain, you don't have the same experience as an American going there because of how they treat it. So when you go to the doctor in Australia, the first thing they say to you is you're going to be okay. It's literally practiced so that when you're met in a medical situation, the first response is you're going to be okay. And in America, it's, oh, shit, we better get some tests. Let's get some x-rays, some MRIs. And now you came in with a simple backache, and you're like, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? I got to get all these tests. And it's become so cultural now that people want the x-ray. And the x-ray, this is a fact of why we do x-rays. It's to rule out fractures. It's to rule out tumors, cancers, things like that. If you have degeneration in your lumbar spine and you're over 30, it's normal. There's nothing abnormal about it. And yet now you have the diagnosis of, oh, I have degeneration. I People honestly tell me all the time, like, you're over 30. That's what happens. Do you, do you look in the mirror and see <laughs> your skin is degenerated too, man? So, you, of course, your joints, <laughs> do you think your joints weren't going to degenerate? Like, holy cow. But now they have the diagnosis. And if they come in, a, a, so a, a degenerative arthritis of the spine hurts after prolonged positions. So like when you wake up in the morning, you're stiff and sore. You go on a long car ride, you get out, it's stiff and sore to move. It doesn't bother you when you're moving. Mm. It feels better to move. Mm. So when someone comes in and degeneration's their issue and they feel worse moving, it ain't degeneration. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like, that's that checkoff list. And yet because they have that diagnosis, damn it, that's what they that's want. What it that's, is. that's what they, and then they manifest, I can't do that. It's going to make my arthritis worse. Movement is what makes arthritis better. It's inactivity that makes it worse. Totally agree. That's what you were saying, like yeah. we were saying before we started. That everything is psychosomatic. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it really is. <laughs> but once you believe it, it's yeah. the, and so that's that dance. That's that art, man, because it's the dance around to get somebody to understand without stepping on their turf of what they really believe is important. Mm. And and it's this is the the laziness of the modern medical because again the first thing you're going to hear in Australia is you're going to be fine. In America is oh shit you have degeneration. And then it's called degenerative disc disease. 
it's not a disease, but that's the term. So that for a long time, what do you have? I have degenerative disc disease. Yeah, it's the same with IBS. Yeah. I tell you, I have yeah. irritable bowel. You've just told me my symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. You've- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank I'm you. confirming it. I'm just calling it this name. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. That's how it works. So yeah. All right. I got one more question for oh, you. Oh, cool. Okay. Yep. So what do you think about cliff bars? <laughs> <laughs> It's an unfair question. <laughs> uh, I had to ask one. Yeah. So part of the reason why I started eating Cliff Bars, this is so corny, but um, there's a podcast, uh, How I Built This. Yep. Yeah. And then Cliff Bar is on there. And I, I had Cliff Bars in the past, and it, I had listened to the podcast, and I happened to be going to the grocery store. I'm like, oh. And it had one that was called Trail Mix or something. like, I'm going to have a Trail Mix cliff bar and so then i bring it in and and so the story about it is that there's a we have this piece of paper and it's marked off a little um checking off how many i have a day i had <laughs> one day that i had two of them and so then it became this thing at the office like how many is he eating a day i'm like i have one day <laughs> but so what happened was like i i wake up um usually around f- between 5 and 5 30 and I come into work and I get the day set and stuff. And I used to have like oatmeal or something to have in the breakfast, but I'm not really hungry in the morning. So instead of eating just for the sake of eating, I just wait. So then be- you see how uh, busy I-, I get pretty yeah, busy. Yeah. So I don't take breaks. So that's the other thing. Like as a kid, my first business was a house painting business. And I believe a lot of the reason why I was successful is because we didn't stop for lunch. Hmm. So we worked from 7 a.m. till 5 p.m. We literally ate sandwiches on the ladder, drank water, things like that. So there was no lunch break. And so we'd get jobs done quicker. So my first PT job, I'm working, and the guy asked me what I do for lunch. And I'm like, I get, I had no idea I got a lunch break. So I had an hour lunch break, and I was bored out of my mind. It takes me 10 <laughs> minutes to eat. And I'm like, okay, I got 50 minutes to do what? So I always wanted to be working instead of – I would rather work right straight through and go home mm-hmm. than to have that hour have the same break. Thing. So as a result, I need to have some kind of – if I don't, I'll start to get a little loopy. And uh, <laughs> so – this time of season, I'll be having apples most of the time, but the whole Cliff Bar started because of the stupid podcast. <laughs> and then they saw me eat a couple of them. So now I'm like, but now I'm messing with them. So just so you know, there's a, on the little board, I went in and the Katie and Jacqueline were, were sitting there and or they were working with patients and I had the little marker and I was going and checking it off. <laughs> well, they weren't looking. And so then they're like, how many did you have yesterday? I'm like, what are you talking about? So, yeah. I have a uh, really good group, though. I, good. They're I really all great. Every, yeah. I mean, I've seen you and Sarah and yep. Jacqueline, and, yep. and I have no complaints about yeah. any of it. Y'all have your own flavor too, which is yeah. great. Yeah, and you know the uh, so for a while after my practice in Gloversville closed, I was really getting like um, I don't I don't want to do therapy anymore. So I hated dealing with the insurance companies, and I was just I wasn't in a good place. And it was all the way, and Sarah started to work for me, and. And the reason why I hired her, she didn't know this, but I, I I make the therapist now who I'm interviewing, they have to come and spend some time with me. So it's not an interview. They have to come in for a few hours. Number one, to see how I do therapy, because I am not like normal therapist. The environment I create there, most of what you see is intentional. So I want it to be light and friendly. I love when patients feel safe. So I wanted to have that from across the board. Everybody you You do there. a very good job of making people you, yeah. you joke around yeah, and like exactly. it, I love time. it. It yeah. makes you always have something. So that started because a, a therapist, a buddy of mine, Jim Elliott, who is in Baltimore when I worked there, and I called it social therapy. He was cracking jokes all day long and he would introduce two patients that had knee replacements together and he'd start a conversation and he'd slip away and they'd just kind of commiserate with each other. It's so beneficial that when you come in there to not like people are already hurting and, you know, not feeling well. And it's not every, this is the art again. So there's some people that don't want that and they want somebody to listen to them. They want someone to hold their hand, things like that. So you got to find the right people. But most of the day I, I am joking around. And so Sarah came in for one of those interviews and I, I hear these two people talking and I'm like, who the heck's going? So I go over there and she struck up a conversation with, she, I haven't even met her yet. I've talked to her on the phone. I haven't seen that her face. That sounds like Sarah. Yeah. And she's, <laughs> and so, and Sarah has this wonderful personality, like someone sees, she's like, oh my God, it's so good to see you. And it's so sincere. She just yeah. means it so much. And, and this is the part where, so then Katie came on board and Katie so I joke with Katie all the time that, and you probably have heard me say this too, that if I'm doing something and a patient's like, oh, that kind of that hurts or something, I'm like, it's Katie's fault. She told me to do it. 
So anytime I'm about to do manual <laughs> technique, I'm like, if you don't like this, it was Katie's idea. <laughs> so it was like a running joke between her and I that I, I blamed her for everything, <laughs> you know, is, is an ongoing joke. And, and then we, when I hired Jacqueline, I wanted to spend time working with her. So Katie and I weren't on shift together. So just lately I changed my schedule. And so <laughs> she's like, I forgot what this is like. Cause I, I blame her all the time. I'm like, Oh, that was Katie's idea. And then patients will joke, get along in the joke and like, Oh, Katie, I don't like you anymore. That's a bad idea. And then Jacqueline came along and she came from a practice that was, they, they're like a, a really intense kind of place. And, and so, so what I was going to say to you is that the three of them, they complement each other so well. Uh, and and Sarah has this femininity about her, and Jacqueline has this strength about her, and Katie's the balance in between. She has Katie is like a, she has the ability to adapt very well, so she can joke around, she can take a joke, she doesn't get upset about it, and it's not teachable. It's that kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's like it's so hard to understand that, and and their sincerity and their concern for people. So. I had conversations with Jacqueline right after she started it. And you can see that thing about like that patient that bothers me. That's how it is. And it reassures me because they're going to be unbelievable therapists. They're already really good at what they do, but you know, 20 years from now. So my, my dream for our business is that we bring people in like that. We have a thing we call residency. So I'm, I'm teaching everything I know, including about business so they can learn all that. And then I'm trying to find out what they like. And then I'm, I'm intentionally pushing them into the muck. So they've got to go through these things, knowing that the only way you're really going to know it is by doing it. It's like and an so, incubator. Yeah. And I want it to be an evolution. So, so, uh, uh, Mackenzie had come this, this beautiful system that changed the world. And David Poulter came along. David Poulter was, uh, Mackenzie's handpicked, uh, instructor and he evolved Mackenzie. And so it was like, he was the one that talked about the patient has all the answer. That's what Mackenzie did, but David put it into a word that for me transformed how I do therapy. And he also, he would joke with the patients too. It was not, it wasn't a, a stiffness. He was from England and he was funny as hell and I'd laugh all the time. And he had all these little, these little ways of, of bringing something out of you and techniques and treatments. And, and he also, Mackenzie had a way of testing things to, to verify it. And David would say, but the patient already told you that. So why do you have to test it? And that's like in the Mackenzie world, that was controversial. And yet, of course, that's an evolution of it. Mackenzie was right. You need to test it. But one way you can test is just by asking. Hmm. And there's nothing wrong with the question. If they give you that response then you can believe them until otherwise. So you go through what's going to help them. And if it doesn't, then fair enough, come back and retest. But that's again, that's a that's a transient a, a, tr- a transition away, a tangent away, and so when I'm talking to these girls, uh, women, they're um, they're so they they know more than I do, they really do, but they don't have the experience that I have do, and so I can reassure them it's fine, and I can tell them those stories of torturing somebody and nothing bad happened and you know they they can go after a total knee replacement like crazy but when it comes to the back they're like oh i don't know i'm like seriously the back has all this ligaments stronger than the damn knee so and then once they see me do it then it's it's reassuring to them and then what we do in the clinic is i'll do something and then we'll have a patient in who volunteers for it and then they'll do it and then we can compare and most of the time they're they're too easy on somebody um, and sometimes it's because I was too strong on somebody. So then I start to learn and I'm, I'm, I'm know enough to know that I don't know that much. I know I'm really good at certain things. I, I can tell that about myself, but there's other things I really don't know well. And so like another example, Jacqueline's better at treating the shoulder than me. I'm better at treating the back than anyone and probably most of the people in the area, but I saw thousands of backs. So when you see so many, it's kind of, it's more that I've seen so many and I kind of have to be an idiot not to be better at it. And yet, and so those experiences allow me to, you know, nudge them around. But one of the things I realized in teaching them was that I was giving them too many shortcuts. So the shortcuts that I look, learned took 20 years to learn. And so I'm handing them these, these solutions. And when they weren't working out, panning out exactly how it's supposed to, they didn't know the process that got them there. Right. And so now I'm like, okay, we got to go way back here. Right. And so instead of assuming this, go through it. And if it doesn't work, it's okay because you know what does work. So just keep going through your process to figure it out. It's like math. When, yeah. you, when you learn a method to yep. do it, yep. but you have no idea why it works. Yep. My son used to look at his hands and he'd figure it out. 
Yeah. 50. <laughs> How the hell did that come to 50? I don't know. Yeah. And so that's, that's what's happening at our office and that it's so, it's a, it's a fun environment and it is intentional because I, I don't want to work when it's tight and stiff. It's no, mm. if, if I'm going to be there, I a want to be busy. I don't want to have gaps in my schedule. I don't want to take breaks and I want to make sure that it's a fun environment for everybody. And that's, it's just so important. So as we bring more people in, that's, that's my dream is that we're going to teach them to be um, ahead of the curve and pushing it too. So we're, we're not, just because someone today said this is the best way to treat this doesn't mean it is hmm. any more than in the fifties. They said, don't bend backwards to McKenzie. And so it's got to constantly, you got to constantly push that way. And one example, I told you, this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm just starting to talk about out loud the fact, and in fact, you're the third person I've said it out loud to. I've been talking to my PTs about it, so it's more than that, but like non-PT people. The glute medius is a big popular one like the psoas in there, and I think the external oblique abdominal is at least a part of it, and nobody's talking about it. And so I want to you know, lead that charge, and that's why I write these articles, and I put it out there knowing that I, I mean, could be I want to kind of try some stretches on that to yeah. see what, what what it does for yeah. me. Yeah. Well, I it's strength more than stretch. It's, it's strengthening okay. it. Yeah. And it's so I just wrote an article about stretching and um and stretching is fine but it it dulls your 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 ability to react to things. So if you're just stretching, um there's a thing called a muscle spindle and a Golgi tendon organs. And they alert your brain that your tissue is being stretched. So if you keep doing them, they don't react quickly. They get dulled. So then when you step outside of that and you do some a fast movement, for example, you're more susceptible to injury because you dulled your reaction time. Yeah. So some stretching mobility is good, but you want to have more strength and reaction to it. So, so I teach that my expression is mobility first, which means your joints are mobile and your tissue is mobile. And then strength is second. So mobility, then stability. And then the last thing is flexibility. And what I typically say at this point in 23 years of doing this, maybe five or 10 people needed flexibility. Most really? people, yeah, it's the joint needs to move and your tissue needs to be mobile. And so if there's a tension, like when you get the knots in your shoulders, that's not going to get a, go away by stretching it. It's going to go away through posture. It's going to go away through manual work. It's going to go away through you moving more, not less. But the flexibility, this is, again, something I stumbled onto. Dan, the, the massage therapist that worked with me, um, he does a, a technique that everyone learns where you pin on that knot and then you stretch away. And I started to go with the stretch because in McKenzie, if you have a joint problem on the right, you go to that side. So I was doing that just kind of spontaneously, and I noticed the muscle relaxed much faster that way. And so it turns out there's techniques called positional release that, that has been out there and published. I didn't know that because I didn't read that. That's what I mean. I don't know this stuff. I don't, I don't have that book smart part. I just did it and it worked. So I kept doing it and I was talking about some, oh, positional release. I'm like, what? <laughs> Never heard of that. So in a way though, you probably have a very, uh, a very intimate relationship with that technique yes, just because I you do. discovered it. Yes. Even if it was already been discovered. It's... Exactly. So that, that's the, that's how I feel about it is exactly what you said, because I feel because and it is possible that somewhere in my education there was, you know, that was mentioned there. So a seed was planted, but it wasn't something that I actively studied. Mm. And so when I had a patient and went through the process, then I figured it out and then I knew it. Mm -hmm. And so now when I have, so I've, I've been with the patients that have had like some extreme back pain because I worked with a spine surgeon. So I saw people immediately after surgery. I saw people who went into surgery within days of meeting us. So I saw like the worst of the worst. I saw bowel and bladder loss. I saw muscle, loss, like all kinds of problems. And so when you do that, you, you don't, you lose the fear over it. You don't, you don't have that same worry. And again, most people do well. There's only a very small percentage who don't. So my attitude towards the panicky ones was always like, you're going to be fine because that's all I ever saw is people were fine. And so, but then I also learned by, by making those mistakes that that way didn't work. So, so I'll give you a quick example. In McKenzie, I learned to do a, a retraction for the headaches. So, and that's an effective way to treat a headache. And yet what I learned by trial and error was that side bend with rotation was so much faster. Oh my God. So that, is, that is like my key. Yeah. When something and, feels tight, 
Right. That's what I even it, even just to bring me into awareness of what's yeah. going on. Right. So that little thing started. It's the same type of story I'm telling you about because for 15 of my 20 years, I only did the retractions. I didn't have that in my toolbox. And I don't remember if I saw someone do it. I don't remember if it was me playing around and somebody got better. I don't even remember why I did it. I just remember that it was faster than the other one. And so I started to do it with everybody. And then Dan was, he's a massage therapist and he does shiatsu and acupressure points and stuff. And so I literally had on my wall an acupuncture chart so I could see where the meridians ran because I didn't know the meridians. And I, patients would be laying on their stomach and I'm pushing and I'm like, I'm on your stomach meridian right now. <laughs> and I'd be, then eventually I'm on your stomach. Like I could talk about it as if I knew what I was talking about. But what I learned was I'm not a massage therapist. I'm not going to take an hour to do that. So I started to get more and more narrow. So I had a, a, the patient that came in with that, the hip problems and all of them, all your IT band tightness, every one of you have a tightness on the lateral quadricep. And if you go about midway up the, the leg, I can push on it and people are going to flinch because it hurts there. So I'll go do a workshop for runners and I'll, I'll have someone come up on the table and I'll go right to the spot and they'll flinch. And I say, okay, that's the pressure and that's the, it's, it's the stomach meridian. So I'll push on the stomach meridian and then I'll recheck them and they'll see, oh my God, it already feels better. And so I, I do that because number one, it's faster. And I, then I taught, taught the, the women who work for me, I taught them the same thing. If someone comes in with symptoms in this area, push here and here. And I didn't explain to them why, just <laughs> push here and here. Trust me on this one. And then I talked to them about the first evaluation. All that matters is the patient feels A, they were heard, and B, they walk out feeling better. If they don't feel better physically, they feel better mentally or emotionally. That's all that matters. Nothing else matters. You just established a rapport. Now you can get deeper and deeper into it. And so for me, I switched from my program. I go right into how do I make someone walk out of here feeling better? And it's, it's again, that hyper-focused into that way. And so those little key spots, that's what I do with people. So that's I can amazing. go on and on about this. No, you're so. good. I'd love to have you on. I'd love yeah. to have you on again. Sure, you got man. A lot of, you got a lot of experience and yeah. stories. Yeah, I have a ton of stories. We didn't even get into the whole farming thing or anything. No, yeah. no. We'll get into that next time. Okay. Sounds good. Matthew Goodemont. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very much for having no, me. Thank I you. love this. This is awesome. I'd love yeah. to have you on again. Yeah, cool. I'll do <laughs> cool. it. Yeah, thanks. thanks, man. All right.
to, to just defend the physicians, they have a couple minutes. And so I have, I can make it, I own the place so I can make it as long as I want. But you know, you have, I see a patient two to three times a week for four to six weeks. You can figure it all out. And if the doctor had that amount of time with them too, they'd figure out more than I could figure out. So it has nothing to do with that kind of thing. It's, it's more their time is pressured. And they're really, big part of what they're doing is to figure out the oh shit stuff. So they're listening to see, is this cancer? Is this a heart disease? Is this some kind of obscure disease? I can't even tell you what it is. I don't, I don't know that stuff. Right. And so my niche is I know I'm good at what I do somewhat because I've been doing it for 23 years, a lot because of that teacher I told you about because it really changed how I do things. Hmm. But again, back to that science part, it's not, I, I'm like really primitive in what I talk about. Yeah. And so I even know when I'm writing articles and or on the air that if there's a physical therapist listening, they're probably thinking this guy doesn't know what the <laughs> hell he's talking about. And there's some truth in what they're saying. And yet I know it's what the patient needs to hear, or I can sense that that's going to help them more than me saying to them that, you know, you have a herniated L4, L5 disc, like who the hell cares? Yeah. That, and, that just sounds scary. Yeah. And, and so that's, you had said something about that. Like we get in the way patients, people get in the way of the body. We're not doing anything to just, I mean, on the real primitive level, breathe, make yourself breathe. And so, yes, you can slow your heart rate down. You can slow your breath work down, but you can't make your lungs stop and you can't make your lungs go. They're going to do it completely. In fact, as soon as you get out of the way, they just go on their own merry way. And it's like that with everything, everything. And so I really, and, and the place I had before the current place, we called it a wellness center. And so we did a lot of this kind of talk with patients. I don't do it as much anymore. And there's there's a lot of reasons why. There's there's um there's things that happen to me personally that make me resistant or hesitant is a better word to dive into some of the things we're talking about. Because people um it it's work to go into the the non um what was the word you said before the you're analytical, very scientific, rational. very rational. Yeah. Because when, because there's also people have stories and dramas that go around things and they have religious beliefs and they have cultural beliefs. And so you start to get that into the big muck and it, it makes, it makes for a mess. And so in that regard, that's what I mean by listening to someone, because I, I have worked with all nationalities, ages, every kind of um, belief system that you can imagine. And so it's fine with me. I can, I can dance in all of them because within that is my way of guiding you to the basic principle of you need to move or you need to stop doing this, but do this instead. And, and that's, that's not, I don't know. Like, so when I see physical therapists, I, I see how they process things and I really feel like I'm not a very good physical therapist. <laughs> But I really can I tell you, like, right, but I can tell, like, I can tell you how to get better more because I know that rest of it. That's the point. So okay. I, I can walk where you walk. I, and, and, you know, like the, the chameleon kind of thing. I can talk to the most spiritual religious person and I can talk to the most country bumpkin redneck person. My whole family um, live in the country. So I have a whole bunch of cousins that I'm real familiar with that turf. And I actually like when the real smart, intelligent person that comes in and starts speaking a lot of big words, because I just start throwing Latin and <laughs> anatomy and physiology <laughs> terms at them. And, and I also know there's alpha males that come in, and I can present myself as a stronger alpha male and take over the room. But I can also be really bending and um, very zen and letting go and let somebody else have the way, you know, the bamboo thing. I can, yeah. I, I very much can do that. That's great. It's, it's kind of like dreams in a way because we all have them, mm -hmm. but, and they must mean something. I mean, it must, it must be like, but it kind of is your own language. Yeah. It's you dream in your own language. Right. You, right. you, you, your dream is not going to mean much to me. Right. And if it does, it's definitely not what it meant to you. And I don't need to have my dream influence you. Right. Yeah, you're, you're you're listening to my dream yeah. and under, trying to understand yeah. how how it impacts me. Yes. And then that's the using art. my own language right to help me right. figure out what right. what it is. That I I had a, a early mentor. He was a classmate of mine, and he had such a good way of explaining things to people. So I asked him, you know, how he got so good at it, and he said to me, "I imagine that I'm talking to my dad, and my dad's a blue collar guy. So if I can explain it to him, I can explain it to anyone." 
And so I took the same type of idea and I, I would figure I could explain it to my mom. And my mom is, um, she's a wonderful person, and, and, but she would, she would challenge me. She would question it. So I had to figure out a way not to take that personally. That's her story, not mine. So if she doesn't like how I'm saying it, it's my agenda. I have to change how I'm saying it to help her. So I let go of my way and find your way and whatever it is. I, I, I mean, I, of all the skills that I feel the strongest in, that's where I feel the strongest with patience. That's, I mean, I find that difficult to do. I mean, I know exactly what you're describing. Yeah. Because I know for a fact, just even outside the physical therapy, yeah. but in the helping a person, yeah. you can't help a person who, who you you can't do it for them. No. And you, you don't get to decide the no. way they do it. You don't no. get to decide how they figure it out. Right. I can know exactly what someone's problem is. Yep. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If they don't know what it is, right. I I can't there's just a there's a famous them. quote my my teacher David talked about and it's it's um it's something to do with you're getting someone to have their your way but they think they're doing it it's their way <laughs> and it's some like Winston Churchill quote or something like that that's that's diplomacy and and that's like these these little things all these mentors that come along in my life and and those mentors the ones that I admired the most were the ones that could communicate the best to the patient and and or were incredibly calm and so there is, I don't get rattled. It's, I mean, I shouldn't say that because something will come in tomorrow and it'll rattle the hell out of me, but it's rare for me to get rattled. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, a, a gentleman that fell. It wasn't my patient. It was one of my other therapist's patient, but I just go over and I'm just talking to him. And part of that is because if I go over panicked and nervous, he's already scared and worried. So all it's going to do is magnify the problem. And so then I, I listen to him and how he's talking. And if he's already making jokes about it, then I start, you know, saying things like, I hope you didn't put a dent in my floor. So it just like, you know, breaks the ice and he's not worried about it and say, you know, just take a minute and we'll get you up. He said, I don't think you can get me up. I can get you up. If I have to get three people or I get a truck in here, I'll get you up. Don't worry about that. So, but it's, it's, and then at the other end, there could be someone who's really scared. So I'll just sit down right next to him and just breathe with him. And there's a, I don't know where, I'm trying to think where I, that comes from, but there's something about when you're around somebody else that's really common breathing, you're, you'll start to breathe in sync with them. And there's like a triggering reaction. So I practiced breath work for years. So you had mentioned meditation and things. And I would go into a private room at my last office and just literally breathe and meditate for five minutes in between patients to make sure I was calm inside. And then what started to happen to me kind of spontaneously is when the, the stress would come up, I would just start to be breathing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because I was trying to, it was because I'd practiced so much. So in those moments, if I'm calm, the person next to me is going to calm down. And I actually, I had a, a therapist that worked for me for a while, and we would practice that. We would get the people that were really excitable and tense and worried and fearful. And he and I would just really practice our deep breathing, grounding, and just to see, like as a game, that can we calm this person down without talking to them, without touching them, just by us being calm. And it was really remarkable to see the impact of it. And it, it definitely, I mean, most people who have kids will know this. If a kid, child goes down and you freak out, it just makes it worse. But if you're calm and you talk in that calm way, the child will kind of follow along. Well, that works for adults too. Yeah. So it's a, I, it's the same with dogs. <laughs> yeah. It's a, absolutely. And, uh, girl, like if you have a significant other and they wake up in the middle of the night with in bed with you and they had a nightmare. Yeah. And they just grab you. Yep. They can't just talk to you. And you're not going to make it. them better no. by saying it's fine, no. you're safe. It's but if just, you just lay there yeah. and you stay relaxed, and relaxed and calm. They they Amen. Yeah. It yeah. works. That's really yeah. interesting. Yep. I did it does resonate because actually last night I was I was, I've, I've started to realize recently that when I get a headache, I think I'm giving them to myself because something happens and I get nervous yeah. about a headache coming on. You're thinking too much. Yes. That's what headaches can be. Yes. Yeah. And so there is something like I, I my posture isn't yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. There's I'm a physical component. It. Yep. But uh, so I'm whatever my body's doing to help me with that, it yeah. doesn't feel great. Yeah. And it happened last night. I was laying down and I thought, oh God, it's starting to happen again. I'm getting yeah. all nervous. And then I, th I just took a breath. Yeah, I just felt like I'm out of my way. Yeah, I'm I'm actually here now. I'm not thinking about what if, what if, right. what happens now, what happens next. Right, it's gonna be like it was before. Right, and my body just 
it did what it did. I went right back to sleep, right. and it was no big deal. So that's the difference between pain and suffering. Pain is a physiological re reaction. Suffering is a mental 